Miss Wilson Jones. Yes, Dr. Wilson. Here. Director Mack. I'm here. Director Rankin. I'm here. Thank you. Director Rivetta Smith. I believe I'm just receiving texts from Director Rivera Smith and Director Hampson that they're still attending the meeting. So please pause. And for a few more. Thank you, Director Hampton. Again, folks, please turn yourself on mute and please keep your cameras off. This is a work session of the Board of Directors, and so we want to make sure our board and our staff can enter the, the meeting and, and be part of the discussion. Do we have Director Vera Smith with us? Okay, we are waiting one moment on our superintendent and staff. Thank you all for your patience and flexibility. We're trying to make sure we can hold this meeting and 350 is a lot of people on team. Uh, President DeWolf, I got another text that Director Rivera Smith is having a hard time getting in still. Hi. I'm on now. Thank you. I, I'm oh, they got me in. Thank you so okay. much. Thank you, Director Rivera Smith. That completes uh, our roll call for today. Director Rivera Smith is present, as well as Director Rankin and Hampson, uh, and myself, Director DeWolf. Um, now that we have um, done our roll call as directors, uh, I believe the superintendent on the call now as well. Uh, President DeWolf, I am on, but we still have a couple of staff who are presenting who have not um, gotten on yet. Thank you. And just a reminder, this is a uh, that if folks would like to hear our public meeting today, you can also watch on SPS TV. Uh, um, so that is also an option. It's also on YouTube. Superintendent, do you know, will you let us know when your when staff has appropriate staff has made it into the room? I will, uh, President DeWolf. I think we're waiting for one or two more is all. Okay. 
Okay, while we are waiting for staff, I'm just going to go over some housekeeping and logistical stuff. Um, uh, Superintendent Juno, so um, that should hopefully give us some time for those folks to get into the meeting room. Um, for today's meeting, we will have sign language and in, uh, interpretation, uh, and I ask that only the ASL interpreter have their camera on today as we begin this meeting. So could we please have everyone else joining Microsoft Teams turn off your cameras now by clicking the camera icon. Directors or staff may turn on their cameras when presenting, but beginning with just our interpreter will allow them to be more easily identified. Those joining in Microsoft Teams can also pin the sign language interpreter's video so that it continues to be displayed by right clicking on that video and selecting pin. For those joining with Microsoft Teams, live captions, also called closed captions, are also available. To use captions, go to your meeting controls and select more actions by click clicking on the icon showing three dots. Under this menu, click the option to quote, turn on live captions. This meeting is being held remotely consistent with the governor's proclamation prohibiting meetings such as this one from being held in person. And I'll note that members of the public will also be joining remotely. I will not be asking members of the public to identify themselves, but thank you to those joining us both on Teams and on SPS TV. To facilitate this remote meeting, I will ask all participants to ensure you are muted when you are not speaking. There will not be a public comment opportunity today, and we will not be using the chat feature into Teams today. Staff will be working to administer the meeting and maybe muting participants to address feedback and ensure we can hear from directors and staff. For directors or staff on the phone, if you feel that you may have been muted and need to speak, please press star six to unmute. One final logistical note as we begin, there is a maximum capacity of 350 for those joining through Teams and by phone. This means that if we near 350 attendees, a waiting room may be utilized to address capacity. Additional attendees will be admitted from the waiting room as capacity permits. This meeting is also being streamed by SPS TV. A link to stream the meeting has been added to today's posted agenda. Superintendent Juneau, I have completed uh, all of the logistical housekeeping needs for us today. Uh, are all of the appropriate staff with us today? I believe we are ready, President DeWolf. Okay. With that, we will now move to the action item on today's agenda. Not this sure how, period. This is the action, this is the board action report titled Approving Resolution Number 2020 slash one. That if you are, if you are, please mute yourselves. Everybody should be muted. Thank you. This is the board action report titled Approving Resolution Number 2020 slash 21 dash four adopting a reopening plan for the 2020-2021 school year. May I have a motion for this item? This is Director Hampson. I move the school board approve resolution number 2020-21-4, adopting a 2020-21 reopening plan as attached to the board action report. Waive in part the following board policies to the extent explained in the policy implication discussion below, policy number 2420, high school grade and credit marking, and policy number 2015, selection and adoption of instructional materials, and approve the purchase from Open Up Education of Expeditionary Learning Education 6 through 8 ELA curriculum materials and accompanying professional development for an amount not to exceed $800,000 for an emergency pilot due to COVID 19. Immediate action is in the best interest of the district. Thank you, Director Hampson. Second the motion. This item has, thank you, Director Harris. This item has been moved by Director Hampson and seconded by Director Harris. Um, today for the process we will use um, is that we will first move into a staff presentation and then directors will um, have questions and comments on, on the underlying action item that was just moved. Following that presentation and discussion, I will then call for any amendments and they will be moved, discussed and voted on at that time. Following discussion and voting on those amendments, we will turn to this underlying action item for, for final comments and action before the vote. Superintendent Juneau, I will now turn it over to you to present this item. Um, thank you, President DeWolf and school board directors. I really appreciate you being here today. I am going to introduce the board action report for adopting the OSPI reopening plan for the 2020-21 school year. As you know, I am recommending that we open the school year in a remote environment. 
While staff, students, families, the community, and I had hoped that we could provide some in-person instruction, I cannot in good conscience ask our staff, students, and community to be in spaces together that could increase the risk of COVID transmission. I want to thank all of the participants in our surveys, those that were on engagement teams, and all of you who sent emails and provided feedback. My heart is really heavy as the superintendent, knowing that we cannot manage and mitigate the health risks at this time and allow students back into schools for learning. Before you today are the necessary documents and my recommendations for the 2020-21 school year. I'm asking for your approval of resolution number 2020-21-4, adopting the completed Seattle Public Schools 2020-21 reopening plan that must be approved and submitted to OSPI two weeks prior to the start of school on September 2nd. Every district in the state must adopt through board resolution, a reopening plan that follows the template provided by the Office of Superintendent of Public Instruction, or OSPI, and then file that plan with OSPI and the State Board of Education. This template is not intended to be a comprehensive opening plan, and it is not meant to be the final word on how each district is going to reopen its schools. It's the document that OSPI and the State Board of Education are requiring that each district file attesting to the existence of plans covering a number of issues and to show a path forward toward the required number of instructional hours. Filing the template fulfills a legal requirement that every district faces, but the work on how our schools will reopen will continue to be fleshed out through the completion of bargaining, through additional work sessions with the board, and through additional board actions. As OSPI has stressed, the template is a living document that is subject to change throughout the year. I know that times right now are uncertain and require flexibility. We all need to lean in and do the best that we can to provide quality services to our students and families. I want to thank our families, staff, educators, school leaders, and students for their patience as we work through this unprecedented time in public education. As we learn more and circumstances change moving forward, we will continue these conversations with the board. We are hoping to update you on the remote learning at weekly work sessions. I look forward to partnering with directors on this work. Included in the materials for today's board meeting are number one, the resolution, uh, resolution 2020 slash 21 hyphen four and two, the 2020-21 OSPI reopening plan, and three, the board action report. We have made changes to the bar before you today. For example, we are not asking that you waive all board policies and board procedures in whole or in part that are in contradiction to the resolution or the plan. We heard your concerns. Um, however, because the board's policy book is written for traditional learning in schools, my staff and I anticipate that additional policies will be identified that will require a complete or partial waiver as long as the district is providing learning in a remote setting during the COVID-19 pandemic. Such policies will be presented to the board for waiver when appropriate. I would like to thank my cabinet and the amazing staff that are supporting this team. I want to acknowledge that this team and their staff have been working around the clock to put structures in place that align with the most up-to-date information about COVID, state and local requirements, and community and family feedback. Directors, I want you to know that I and this team are committed to providing the best high-quality remote teaching and learning possible. We are here today making this commitment to you and to our students and families. With that, I would like to ask Chief Narber to start by restating the OSPI requirements and reviewing questions one and two on the OSPI document. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, good afternoon. This is Greg Narber, the Chief Legal Counsel for Seattle Public Schools. Um, I believe Sec uh, Superintendent Juno uh, covered all the important legal requirements that we're facing today that every district as part of the process for reopening schools for this school year, has to approve through board resolution a completed version of the document that we're referring to as the template. 
and both of the proposed resolutions before the board, the uh, original resolution and the proposed substitute do contain language uh, approving the template. Uh, once that is, um, uh, once that's approved, it will be filed with the both the State Board of Education and the Office of the Superintendent of Public Instruction. Uh, as Superintendent Juno stressed, OSPI has told us that this is a living document. Every district has an obligation to continue to monitor this document and when necessary, revise it. So again, I'll stress, this is not the final word on how Seattle Public Schools will operate this year, but by approving the template, we are fulfilling a, uh, a legal requirement. Um, before I move on, are there any questions at all about uh, from board directors about the template? Uh, uh, I'll just go through quickly um, through the directors. Director Hampson. No additional questions at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Director Harris. Well, I guess this reminds me of the old CSIP plans that say the legal requirement is just that we have to do it. It doesn't have to be correct. And this frankly feels a little like box checking. Thank you. Thank you. Director Percy. No additional questions for me at this time. Thank you. Director Matt. Uh, I guess it's a, a process question. Are we going to be going through um, yeah. this uh, document yes. itself and having staff kind of present and clarify on yes. each of the points yes. as part of this discussion? Is that the process that we're going to go through today? Yes, correct. Okay. Okay. That's, that's great then. Thank you. Thank you. Director Rankin. Um, no, I don't have questions, but I, I just I wanted to say um, appreciate the clarification given by the superintendent for the public at the beginning of this meeting that um, this this is a template of required items that any plan must must meet and um, that uh, it doesn't set things in stone in terms of um, what our families and, and schools still need and as things develop. So I just wanted to reiterate that and appreciate that um, distinction. Thank you, Director Rankin. Director Rivera Smith. Yeah, another uh, kind of future process question because it does say that um, we will continue to update this uh, plan. I'm wondering, as we do that, do we resubmit this template as we go along in the future? Or is there a clear process for how we do update it? Uh, uh, whether or not there's a clear process, I, I don't know, but yes, that would be the assumption that uh, because this is what we're filing with the state agencies in response to these particular 24 questions. This, as we've said, this doesn't cover everything about reopening schools, but this is the current best information we have on these 24 questions. And, and to address a concern raised, I believe we have worked hard to provide accurate information in response to these. There's just a recognition that some issues are still being resolved through bargaining and are still coming together and others are gonna change during the course of the year, including for example, the COVID numbers and whether that dictates a change in how, how we operate and what the health standards are going to be. But this is a, a current snapshot, I believe of, uh, of the best information we can provide at this time, but the OSPI has stressed repeatedly that it expects every district to need to continue to uh, to uh, monitor this and when necessary, revise it. Uh, and there were, the anticipation would be, yes, we would file the revised versions with the, with the state. If there are no other questions, uh, I was asked to just cover the first two, which are fortunately two of the easier ones to uh, address that we have identified the local health officers that I know staff has been in constant touch with to uh, make sure that we're up to date on King County public, uh, Seattle King County public health uh, regulations and rules about uh, our spaces. These are, the, these are our contacts there. And that um, Sherry Cox in answer to number two is the primary district level point of contact for all reopening issues, and then she can in turn uh, delegate to appropriate staff to uh, address the specifics. 
Uh, with that, I would go, I believe, unless there are questions on those, I would oh. go back to uh, Superintendent Juno to lead us on through the template. President DeWolf, this is Director Mack. I do have a question. Um, yes, Director Mack. Uh, thank you. So number one says that we've identified a primary local health officers, but it doesn't state Seattle King County. Um, I think that clarification might be helpful because those names, I assumed they were local health officers within our district and I didn't, They're it's just not clear County. that those are Seattle King County officials. Um, so that clarification would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Superintendent Juneau. Yes, thank you, President DeWolf. I think uh, Chief Codd is up next. Okay, so um, questions have come up about um, number three. So we have communicated out to employees. Uh, we actually communicated back in March the different types of leave that one could take um, for um, either being high risk or accommodations that could be made to work in a remote environment. That was sent out to all employees on March 18th. We have additional information on our HR webpage in the form of an FAQ, frequently asked questions. To date, 236 employees have taken different types of COVID leave or have identified themselves as high risk, and nine people have requested accommodations. This is still a subject of bargaining um, with many of our labor partners, so what comes up in the fall will may change slightly, but we have a plan for this in place. Okay, thank, thank you, Chief Todd. We should certainly keep moving through. We have about an hour and 35 minutes before we're at three. Thank you, President DeWolf. I believe Chief Podesta is up now. Hello, this is Fred Podesta, Chief Operations Officer. And question four relates to drop off and pick up plans which we're reviewing in our review of such. We're reviewing these plans um, as part of a site-based plan that we're developing for every um, school building where we'll have activity uh, on-site instruction. Um, this is a partnership between the relevant operations department and uh, schools and continuous improvement, particularly the coordinated student health department. And these plans cover um, furniture in buildings, uh, zones, uh, control of heating and ventilation systems, um, cohort models for how classrooms will be divided, and the appropriate entrances and pickup and drop off from both district provided transportation and family transportation. Um, it, in this, each uh, uh, plan that will be produced is produces a site plan and a toolkit for school leaders that will cover um, the procedures that are needed for pick up and drop off and access to buildings, controlling access to entrances, and then facilities will provide the uh, requisite signing marks on the floors um, and stanchions to kind of guide traffic into the building and through the building um, because, you know, there are general guidelines to maintain the uh, physical distancing of six feet where possible, but we need a plan for each building because all our buildings are different and the activities that will be occurring in each different in buildings are a little bit different. So um, we're reviewing these plans as we go and focusing on, um, you know, we started this work when the district was heading towards a hybrid model. So we had kind of worked them through, you know, uh, done site visits and had rough plans for a couple dozen schools. At this point, we're focusing on about 10 schools where we're expecting um, on-site instructions for some students in special education and developmental preschool and Head Start programs. And if we're not stopping for questions at each time, I will turn this over to Chief Jesse for question five. Chief Podesta, let me get back with Dr. If you have any questions really quick. Director Hampson, any questions on three or four? 
Uh, yes, could you just um, speak uh, to the um, how many students we can transport, um, assuming they're receiving special education services, how many students we could transport daily, uh, and um, also how we support our capacity from Kenny Vento, foster students. So and we um, can transfer about 2,000, with physical distancing and the number of um, uh, special education buses available to us based on what we've fielded in the past, we can transport about 2,000 special education students daily. Um, we could probably add additional, uh, that's bus capacity. And then we're working with our um, uh, alternate service providers for both uh, special ed, uh, medically fragile, McKinney Vental, foster care, any kind of out of district door to door transportation um, can accommodate, you know, roughly 400 um, in that category. And um, we've typically transported uh, uh, 35 to 50 students in foster care um, with curb to curb service service and we have that capacity at, at this point we we don't have much concern about vehicle capacity and our all our business partners are eager um, to provide service so um, we're feeling pretty good that we have sufficient capacity and to the extent that we don't use um, buses for uh, transportation um, what what are the what's the impact on those um, can you speak to the impact on, of um, on employees if we're, they're, we're not actively using them for transportation or what other services they might provide? Um, we, you know, are only funded to provide uh, to from transportation, um, and our agreements with our service providers are kind of unit based per, um, per vehicle that they provide on a daily basis. So I. Um, if we are not using, you know, we don't have alternative uses and we're not funded for those at the moment, um, we, you know, it will have certainly an impact, you know, how many vehicles equals how many drivers pretty much. And so, it, and that will probably be the biggest issue as, you know, things change is making sure we can, we have vehicle capacity to make sure that we will, you know, have enough drivers on the bench. Okay, thank you, Chief Podesta. Thank you. Director Harris, three or four. Uh, thank you. I'm curious about which 10 schools are we? I heard the number 65 childcare sites the other day. Uh, I'm confused why we're focusing on just 10 schools if we're going to do 65 childcare sites. Well, the 10 schools are for classrooms and instruction. Um, we are over the summer, we operated. Um, we had partners operating 35 childcare sites. Those um, were configured uh, already to accommodate physical distancing. There are uh, other licensed sites um, uh, that could be used, and um, our uh, staff are working with operators there to make to see who's willing to operate. I think that so that's up to 68. So the the 10 is really about where we'll have special ed instruction um, and, and students um, with teachers as opposed to childcare or distributing meals or other things that might happen in buildings. Thank you. Thank you, Director Thank you. Hersey. None for me at this time. Thank you, Thank you. Director Mack. Uh, thank you, Director Harris, for the question around child care sites and uh, for the answers, um, uh, Mr. Podesta. Um, the questions, I, I had a couple of different questions here that um, piqued my operational brain. Um, you talked about the, the actual plans for those 10 sites and that they've got um, detailed protocols, et cetera. Um, are those plans finalized yet, or are they still in progress? And and when will they be um, available? They're still in progress as we're working um, with our partners in special education about which classrooms and which specific students. Like there's there's still review going on of which students will be on site and when. And I don't think the plans will be final until we get 
to individual students. Okay, and those that's you, that has to have a coincide with IEP meetings. So that's, I know that's a big question because those haven't happened yet. So, um, uh, for you, you also mentioned developmental preschool and Head Start. How many um, students between those uh, programs? I believe, and again, that's um, it's a subset of students that are in those programs that are, are also. Um, uh, being reviewed and those lists are being finalized and will be provided to us. We don't have them quite yet. Uh, do you know when we might have that estimation of numbers? Um, I think this will occur a bit over time. I um, uh, uh, don't have a target date. I, I think um, some of this will probably continue um, past the start of school, we're, you know, we're expecting on the 19th to have uh, the first uh, set of data. Uh, on the 19th, okay, great, thank you. And then my um, final question for now is related to our um, leased spaces in the buildings that are available and have been used for childcare. The, um, under the alignment agreements, understand you said 35 sites over the summer um, have been hosting child care and that uh, potentially likely those same child care providers that have alignment agreements with us may continue and uh, potentially additionally and what another 30 um, have been identified sites have been identified as potential sites um, in those additional sites. If uh, the buildings and facilities have already been modified for safety and distancing in the existing 35. Um, is the expectation or plan that the district will provide uh, the whatever facility modifications are necessary in those spaces? Or uh, are we expecting the CBOs uh, to help support uh, those additional needs? I don't know. Plexiglass, etc. What? Who's we, who's the, who's not who's who's doing that work? Who's paying for it? We're supporting question. that work. It's mostly distancing. It's not plexiglass. You know, it's not the addition of things. It's removing, reconfiguring furniture, and moving things. The additional spaces, the additional op, uh, operators rely on shared space that we manage. So we're we'll support them in that work. The 35 that have been operating thus far are in dedicated space, and we, we provided some support to help them configure their spaces. But um, the, so, as we grow, they'll be growing so, into common. So, yeah, thank you okay. for so so specificity. It's it's existing classroom spaces that are being converted. Director Mack, three and four are asking if we've reviewed, and we've reviewed, and so I just want to make sure we stick to that because we still have an hour and a half of this. So. If we can hold that until the appropriate time, but these three, these two okay. questions are: Have we reviewed and reviewed right. pickup plans? I just want to be, but but hold that. Is that okay? Thank you. Okay, Director Rankin. I'm good on this. Director Barry Smith. No questions right now. Thank you. Thank you. And I have none here. So Chief Esty, we'll turn it over to you. And if you want to do a you know, maybe the next three to four, we can pause and, and do a few more questions after we get to maybe number nine. Thank you, Director DeWolf. Hi, YHSE. Chief of Schools of Continuous Improvement. Um, this item is discussing health screening uh, for the district. Since the early spring, we have been relying on attestation. Uh, five specific questions that we do developed with Sing Seattle King County Public Health. Uh, we started with the posting uh, of those uh, attestation questions at the entries to our schools, uh, moved also to uh, having sign-in sheets, a common sign-in sheet, and a attestation uh, uh, agreement on those five questions for when staff signed in. Uh, since that time, uh, we've, we've used that information to help provide case tracking where necessary. We've only had uh, two particular situations uh, since in the spring that where we had to use that information. Um, and it was really, uh, that's the critical reason why um, we have that information. Um, and since the 
also though, since that time, we've also had a uh, development uh, to move those questions to an online or electronic format. We have them in Microsoft Forms. We have now uh, the ability to send them uh, via email and text to staff as they enter school this spring, given the current drafted plan for remote learning uh, for any of the staff that come on to site, including at the John Stanford Center. They would be sent uh, a QRD. They could just simply open up that form either in the link or through a QRD uh, also that is available when they walk through the door. We would have a process where if uh, staff that are dedicated or we know that are coming in on a particular day do not answer the questions within 30 minutes of their entry time, then that would uh, generate for the COVID-19 teams at each of our sites to start to make phone calls. And again, and, uh, having the sign-in sheets also available at the door so that the staff can work through to ensure that folks have done the anastation who are coming on to uh, our school sites and work sites uh, here in Seattle Public Schools. Then we can take that data, uh, use that data to, again, not only screen, but we can also have uh, information about uh, using that with uh, public health agencies around uh, identification of any hotspots coupled with other data points such as attendance. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Jesse. I'm going to just pause uh, one moment here. I am getting word that we need to just make sure our uh, ASL interpreter is uh, accessible and visible. Um, so I just want to pause to make sure we can um, put the And I, I am not sure if our ASL interpreter has joined us yet. Um, so um, in, in the meantime, um, uh, folks can go ahead and turn on closed captioning if that might provide some assistance um, by pressing the three dots, selecting more actions, and then selecting turn on live captions. Um, we'll work to continue to figure out um, how we can get our ASL interpreter to join us. Uh, uh, if you could also turn on closed captioning from the control from your end so that it can be seen on YouTube's live stream. Um, thank you, Director Hampson. Um, Edgar, if you could turn on captions on your screen, those should be available then through the YouTube live stream. Um, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so Jesse, if you were done with number five, Move to number six. So for number six, uh, commonly held uh, health standard of six feet of physical distance. Uh, as we moved uh, towards the end of the school year and into this uh, summer, really going on doing calculations at each of the sites about square footage. Really that bubble is an estimation of around 50 square feet for each student um, at a desk site. We've done uh, over dozens of walkthroughs at different sites along with um, staff. Uh, happen to recognize that each individual classroom is generally unique given the type of desks that are in the class as well as other furniture and items. Um, so going through each of those using um, that calculation and doing literal walkthroughs at each uh, each classroom across the sites and setting up desks um, as many as we can to again abide by the six feet rule understanding that you know uh, having proper walkways uh, to access or exit uh, or access materials or items within the classroom as well as entering and exiting the classroom itself uh, with that also includes setting up schedules uh, for us when folks would access common areas such as bathrooms or accessing uh, meals uh, as we distribute them as well as um, playgrounds for the younger students. So just going through all those uh, particular frame, uh, planning elements with a team of many multiple teams of folks, including um, our health services department and facilities working as a team to make sure uh, places were set up. Uh, looking forward to this fall, primary focus right now has been also in setting up for, as already noted, for special education services for those 
who would benefit from those services or need those services per the IEP team um, on site or in person. Um, so we've been setting up those spaces and that also includes in a study of HVAC or the ability to have ventilation in those spaces that meet the health and safety standards put out by the CDC and also the Departments of Health here in Washington. That's the conclusion of number six, Director DeWolf. Thank you. Okay, let's move to number seven. Uh, Chief Operations Officer Fred Podesta. Um, we are uh, for on-site instruction um, to ensure physical distancing. We're planning um, serving meals in classrooms and not using lunchrooms, um, since uh, as uh, Chief Jesse noted, and I had said with regard to the earlier question, the classrooms are already established to have the um, physical distancing requirement. So that's um, how we'll um, meet this with regard to provision of nutrition services. Number eight. I think that's Chief Jesse, thank you. So for number eight, we're talking about frequent hand washing. We've had common signs posted across all of our sites, including the John Stanford Center about hand washing. Um, as Chief Codd also mentioned, we've been providing some notification and trainings and, and guidance to our staff regarding hand washing. We've been teaming together on that and putting information out, uh, not only directly in, in written information, the signs, uh, but also for our school leaders, uh, for them to also guide and uh, their staff and making sure as they set up, again, those common areas and for also folks coming and using uh, their spaces that they come in, wash their hands. When we eat meals, we wash our hands. Any contact with common areas or materials, we would be uh, requesting that, of course, folks wash their hands and then leaving the building as well. So those are the things. We also, uh, as we enter the building, at the sign-in areas for attestation, for anybody entering buildings, we also have put out hand sanitizer uh, as to be convenient for people to do that as well as clean, clean pens um, to help minimize, again, the exposure to any of the COVID-19. Okay. Number nine. And why I think I can take the next couple of questions. Um, again, this is uh, Fred Podesta. Um, we have established uh, guidelines for face coverings requiring all occupants in buildings uh, to wear face coverings unless there's a disability or health impairment that prevents um, uh, them from accomplishing their role with, with that equipment. Um, we have uh, uh, um, an adequate supply to cover all staff and we um, have built, uh, again, going in as we were planning for the hybrid model, we accumulated a 90 day supply of staff, assuming all staff were in buildings every day and that um, there would be three uh, and the supplies include face coverings, gloves um, and hand sanitizer. Um, and we assumed with regard to um, question 9A that uh, we would need three face masks uh, per 15 student classrooms per day. Um, so we feel like particularly with the uh, relying more on a remote model, we have, uh, we're well stocked with um, all the PPE that we need at, at the start of school. Um, and we've um, been working with coordinated health on any additional Protect, personal protective device, uh, equipment that um, folks will need to support um, special education students. We've identified the suppliers that we need um, um, for face coverings and other PPE and are prepared with follow-up orders uh, once we work through the stockpile that we've already built. Um, moving on to question 10, if I might. Can, yes, sorry, this is... Through to number 12 number and then we'll... We get through this first We're still getting some messages that the closed captioning and interpreter are not available. Uh, 
So our director of policy and board relations got kicked out of the meeting and I'm trying to invite her back in and I'll ask her to speak to that as soon as she's back into the meeting. Hi, this is Chief Berge um, over <laughs> IT. Uh, so we have pinged Microsoft with the issue on closed captioning. You should be able to turn it on. We can see it there. We can press the button. It's just not working right. Uh, right now, the workaround would be to go to YouTube and turn on closed captioning there or um, SPS TV. Both of those would provide closed captioning. Erin, I'll just wait a couple more moments for Ms. Wilson Jones. We will keep trying. Um, I think you can and keep keep moving. I'll I'll see what I can do to um, find the answer. This is uh, Chief Operations Officer Podesta again. I if I can move on to question ten, if you'd like me to. Yes, please. Um, so our busing, um, working with our busing provider um, to operate buses. Uh, at, with a capacity of up to one uh, student per seat um, with exceptions for siblings or students who come from the um, same household. Um, this, um, you know, our general transportation standards are uh, K through five. Students are uh, three per seat and um, six through uh, uh, grade six and beyond are two. So this, you know, theoretically reduces the capacity, you know, by a half or a third. Um, that said, um, you know, with the bus fleet we have, we can accommodate up to 6,400 students, and we were transporting 8,400 students in the previous school year um, on yellow school buses. So we're not too far short on capacity. Um, we have a step, and there's a second question about cleaning, um, but, uh, and again, um, with the actual transportation that we'll be providing to um, special education, developmental preschool, and Head Start to selected students. We have more than enough capacity. And um, during a regular school year, you know, our special ed vehicles are not um, generally um, uh, highly, uh, you know, operating at capacity. So we're pretty comfortable that um, our physical distancing uh, goals can be met, even though um, the standards are a little bit relaxed um, for uh, vehicles. Moving on to question 11. One moment, please. We need to really resolve this accessibility issue. And um, so we need to solve that. Director DeWolf, um, I am uh, waiting to hear back from, from Ellie. She still is not able to make it back into the meeting. Um, perhaps we could pause for just a, a brief few minute recess uh, while we, we look into this. Thank you, that, that's fine. I, I'd rather we, we resolved than, than not. Clarification, President DeWolf, are we going into a recess? And is there a time limit for that? Uh, I, you seem like you're really far away from your phone, but I think you asked about a recess, and I'm just pausing here for a moment to see if we can resolve this in real time. And if it gets too long, yes, we certainly consider a recess, but I, th I think people are trying to resolve it. There is no closed captioning on YouTube as of now. Hi, this is Carrie Campbell, Chief Public Affairs Officer, um, Director Hampson. The only way it's gonna show up on live YouTube 
is if the captioning is turned on on Teams. And it looks like that functionality, as jo um, Chief Berge described, is not currently working. It shows up for pre-recorded YouTube, not live YouTube, which is what we had to transfer today to accommodate the request to stream. I'm going to, uh, Director Wolf here, I'm going to suggest a five minute recess. Uh, if just, just to pause here and I'll help uh, give folks the space and the flexibility to resolve this and we'll, we'll adjourn back at 1.56 p.m. Um, thank you. Are, folks are joining just as we
right, so question 11, uh, this is Fred Podesta, Chief Operations Officer. Uh, question 11 uh, asks about uh, the cleaning regimen in buildings and buses. Our uh, school buildings will be clean uh, daily. Classrooms will be clean daily, which is a departure from our uh, uh, regular mode of cleaning every third day. Bathrooms will be clean three times a day. High touch common areas and high um, uh, uh, door handles, uh, stair banisters and other things in common highly trafficked areas will be cleaned throughout the day. The day custodians will be assigned to um, clean those commensurate with the building traffic. And then the indoor spaces that either are used for meal distribution or adjacent to meal distribution when it's done outside um, will be sanitized um, each day meals are distributed using an electrostatic sprayer um, um, to totally uh, sanitize the space since there's food involved. Buses will also be on a daily cleaning schedule. Um, a disinfectant will be applied to all surfaces um, where that makes uh, skin contact with students, seats, fronts and back, and seats themselves, the grab railings on the seats and the railings um, for entry and exit into the bus and the window latches. And uh, again, the disinfectant will be sprayed on the bus and allowed to remain on all surfaces for 10 minutes and then wiped down on a daily basis. And I'm gonna pass it on to Chief Jesse for question 12. Again, good afternoon, Wyatt Jesse, Chief of Schools of Continuous Improvement. We have clearly established procedures for uh, situations involving any kind of suspected or known cases of COVID-19. We've had to address these issues this past spring and summer, uh, so we have been tested on that particular uh, set of procedures uh, for us to make sure that if there was a case, we go back to our annotation uh, ability to, for folks to record where they are at. Um, that's why the state guidance is also around having five or less individuals in one particular area for most certainly trying to keep the distance of 16 feet, but also if they are uh, have uh, situations where they have been in contact in uh, relatively close proximity for 15 minutes or more, or have suspected cases, we moved to uh, having them self quarantine uh, prior to any testing. Uh, we go through uh, the list uh, for us. We send a notification out to anybody who's on a site uh, while that individual is there uh, who are uh, with a suspected or um, confirmed case. Uh, when we are able to confirm a case, we also run down our phone uh, list, uh, again, based on uh, folks recording themselves at a particular site. So we make individual phone calls on their situation and, and uh, run through the series of questions to help provide them with guidance of whether they should see a health care provider or not. And just kind of really, again, working on how, what was their contact or not their contact uh, with any, uh, again, suspected or confirmed cases uh, for individuals in the, in the district. Continue to work with our local health care agencies. I think that's really critical for me to continue to say. Uh, they are really, and also our... Um, uh, medical care professionals in the area. We, we just had a meeting last week. We have another one this week uh, with them just to really think about how can we provide additional testing across our sites, things like the Seattle flu study. So we are uh, looking to innovate and get ahead of this as much as possible uh, whenever possible for us because just relying on uh, for us to take uh, temperatures is, is late um, according to the health professionals. Um, and we find that getting ahead of it is our best case of prevention, um, which I want to stress here for sure. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Jesse. Okay, so now we'll move to di director questions quickly here for questions five through 12, just to finish up part one, which is around health. So we'll start with uh, Director Hampson. Uh, if uh, uh, Chief uh, Jesse, please uh, define attestation that was used throughout, but I don't think that that's a commonly understood uh, term in this context. Thank you, Director Hampson. Yes, attestation is an ability for you to go through a series of self-check or self-monitoring uh, for a set of uh, conditions, in this case, COVID-19, uh, with, uh, again, the assistance of Seattle County Public Health. We have come up with a series of five distinct questions. Those questions 
uh, really, or in, in relations to what that is for your attestation. If you would like me to go over what those uh, five questions cover, I, I can do that as well. No, I, I was just uh, that I think it was, uh, it's not, you know, when we're using terms that are new contextually, we need to make sure that we provide um, definition for them. So that's that's sufficient. Um, I, I, my next question is about the uh, the meals. Please um, provide a, a um, greater overview, um, Chief Podesta, around the number of meals we've been providing during COVID, our expectation for next year, um, how we're going to make sure that we're accounting for uh, increases in uh, free and reduced lunch needs, increases in delivery needs, uh, and uh, the need to expand, or, or how we'll be working with our community-based organizations who will be uh, providing childcare to thousands of our students. Um, we're right now, we have kind of leveled off between 40 and 45,000 students served over the course of a week at the spring and through the summer. Um, and our planning capacity for that amount, um, we're going, uh, this is basically modifications to what we have been doing um, since last spring. Um, we're going to maintain the distribution sites that we have now. Um, add another 15 um, beyond that. Um, the bus delivery had been, um, uh, since we were uh, being um, uh, funded for student transportation um, uh, in the spring, we were using buses to deliver some meals about 900 a day um, uh, using 38 routes. We are going to limit that to the uh, highest volume routes um, uh, starting at the near the end of August um, because we no longer really have the busing, the transportation for buses for th things that aren't student transportation. So we will retain the eight busiest routes that serve about half of those um, 900 meals and then um, we'll uh, work with families and to shift the, to the additional uh, 15 distribution sites we're doing at, at school sites. Um, we are continuing to work with Amazon, which has been great delivering um, uh, about 1,900 meals to 900 locations uh, at students' homes, and it seems to be willing to continue that service into the start of school. So we will continue that as well and continue our partnerships with housing and shelter providers and using um, our uh, warehouse um, distribution uh, unit to deliver meals to students in those um, kind of bulk locations. So at this point, and um, the sites that we're adding, um, you know, we are taking into account participation and demand that we've seen through the spring and summer at our distribution sites, and then taking into account um, in when uh, students were getting meals served in buildings, the participation of, of free and reduced lunch. We'll continue to work with our partners and monitor, you know, um, we uh, monitor kind of the activity at the individual distribution sites and get a lot of feedback from people and see which sites have demand and um, which have less so and can adjust as necessary. Um, but, uh, you know, we're approaching um, 2 million meals that we've served since the spring, you know, about a million in the spring and a million over the summer and with city sites. So um, I think we are going to stick to the things that have been working with us so far. And, um, you know, we'll continue to reach out to partners and partners reach out to us if there are um, other ways we can, you know, understand um, students' needs. We are um, not working on any cost recovery through September and there'll be some transition um, as um, since the buses are expensive and don't you know, provide it's, it's a lot of work and a, and a new expense since we're paying um, for a few hundred meals. We'll see if we can, um, if we need to, we'll backfill that with um, with district staff and district vehicles if there are still some places where the distribution sites are not convenient to people. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Director. Yeah, I'd like to follow up on that if I might. Uh, given the fact 
that uh, the $600 unemployment just ended and we don't seem to have any end in sight. Can it be surmised that the, uh, the demand for meals will go up? given the fact that folks are falling off a steep cliff into poverty? You know, we're, pre we're, prepared. Know. we're prepared for additional demand if need be, um, just like we scaled up for the city's summer program. I mean, that's, um, you know, we'll, we'll keep an eye on it. Again, um, when we, we are still not serving the same number of meals we serve um, when meals are being served in buildings, so we have the capacity to add more if need be. Um, we're just, it's also, we're dealing with food, so um, we do need to, uh, you know, keep an eye on it and not produce food that um, uh, isn't consumed right away, but um, this is scalable. Okay, and with respect to coordinating with our community-based organizations, and our potential for 68 child care centers, will we be providing food for all 68 child care centers as well? You know, the, some of them have their own facilities. We, we've done that during the summer to those that want it, and we certainly offered it. But we, we will, if, if it's requested, in, uh, licensed child care sometimes, have, you know, have requirements about breakfast, snacks, and meals, and sometimes have turned to us and sometimes have done things other ways, but um, certainly will be there if need be. And are we working with our good friends and partners at the city of Seattle for uh, compensation for said uh, child care centers? Uh, Director Harris, I want to be thoughtful about those. That's a great question, but if, if it's not pertaining to any of these specific questions, I will ask you to hold it to the end. Questions 5 through 12. Okay, thank you. Director Hersey. <clears throat> yeah, so um, I just would really like to know what consideration, given that um, we're going to have more and more folks who are going back to work in the fall, what consideration are we giving to potentially having some form of meal delivery service for our students who might not have access to it and don't have transportation or a way to get to one of the food sites? Um, again, we, we do deliver uh, meals now, um, and the target audience has uh, two um, students' homes. The target audience for that has been um, special education students, some of whom will be coming into the buildings, so we may be able to shift that capacity to serve others. Um, and again, we've used um, buses up till now that we think we could supplant with district staff um, once kind of our overall staffing levels and requirements um, uh, level out again, and we're adding sites to make sure that there are more sites closer to students and, you know, within walking distance, but we'll monitor that um, demand and then see uh, if um, uh, other types of route-based delivery work, again, the, the, the buses, um, you know, there were some buses, some bus routes that, you know, we're um, delivering a dozen meals. And so we'll try to see if we can package that more efficiently and um, use our own staff um, uh, rather than buses, which aren't a really an ideal delivery vehicle for this kind of thing anyway. But we, we have some um, practices in place where we are delivering, and it's just a matter of kind of scaling it and understanding where the demand is as the um, remote learning settles in and the schedules settle in and we see you know, we, we can shift this demand fairly quickly. We, we have in the past. Thank you. Director Mack, questions on 5 through 12. Yep, I do. I have, I have a number of them, but I'm going to try to combine them and, and make them um, succinct. Um, uh, appreciate the questions around the meal uh, distribution. Um, how many sites with plus 15 will that make? And combining my questions here, at those sites where we've been uh, distributing uh, meals already, given the social distancing requirements, is there a plan to move where that 
physically happens. Right now it's at the entrance way of the building. Um, so I'm wondering whether or not that's been a part of the plan at each building site for physical distancing. Um, so I'll, I'll, that's my first question is about uh, plan, the physical planning of physical distancing of the meal distribution sites um, in context of other staff being in the buildings. Um, and corollary to that is uh, a question about who specifically is responsible for tracking the um, attestations of all staff members and individuals who are coming into the buildings. Um, I know it's uh, Chief Jesse talked about that we are doing this and we'll be doing this testing and tracking and phone calling, et cetera. However, I'm, I'm not clear on who each in the building is on point and actually responsible for that. Um, who's gonna be making the notif notifications, making those calls, because um, that's about as a fair amount of time required, as well as who is physically going to be holding um, and distributing PPE at, at each site? How, how would a staff member or another individual access a mask um, on site? Is that office staff uh, that's gonna be responsible for managing the attestations and PPE delivery? Um, and how does that fit in? How does how does that fit in with the actual physical distancing planning with the distribution of meals in some of those facilities? Thank you. Um, this is uh, Chief Operating Officer uh, Podesta. I'll handle um, some of the meal questions and then turn it over to Chief Jesse for the attestation management. Um, yes, the uh, the um, we started with 26 distribution sites. We collapsed two into one over the course of the summer. So um, we're operating 25 now. We'll add 15 um, for a target of 40. Um, and the specific location and configuration of the sites is um, part of the site planning that we're doing and reconciling against the other activities in the building and controlling you know, traffic and the physical distancing required for meal distribution, um, entry and access to childcare or, or instruction or other things going on in the building. Um, with regard to PPE, um, the, um, we work with custodial staff to make sure it's distributed in classrooms and available um, in, um, and provide the equipment in classrooms. And um, we provided some equipment um, for child care as well. And then um, school staff will work um, with their supervisor, you know, depending on how they're organized um, to uh, get the, you know, so custodial supervisors will make sure custodians have it. Um, teaching staff will work with uh, office staff and we're entering all the equipment into the um, inventory and ordering system that district operates so school leaders can operate um, you know, order more um, uh, masks, gloves, and hand sanitizer as they need it. The cleaning supplies that we use centrally in facility operations um, will manage the um, you know, supply and distribution of those items. And it, just to clarify to the, your answer, thank you very much for that. I'm just wondering, did is that is there one person on point, or is the principal responsible, or is it the combination of expectation between the custodian, office staff, teaching staff? So the principals will be on point for their staff. You know, custodians um, and groundskeepers and maintenance staff and other people that are in buildings, you know, will work within their own units to have their staff oriented um, PPE and the custodians will make sure that classrooms are supplied as needed um, uh, with the hand sanitizer and the uh, extra face coverings for students who show up without such a device. Thank you. Okay, we need to move to Director Rankin. Mr. Wyeth, Jesse was going to answer about the attestations and who's on point oh, for yeah. that, I think. Yeah, and I'll, thank I'll you, make it brief. Uh, Chief Podesta. 
Thank you, Director Mack. Uh, um, that's that's a good question. So when the information is the attestation information comes in, like I said, the procedure that we have uh, would say 30 minutes if they didn't, we'd make phone calls. Um, we're not having huge congregations of staff, as you know, coming back into remote learning, uh, but it does provide us with an on, online, the online ability provides us, gives us the data into a shared data management system for each individual school site. That information will be taken on a team, so a COVID-19 team for, that will be put together at each site. Each site has a designated COVID coordinator who will have to oversee that process and that information. And then for oversight, that information, because it is into a data management system operated by the district, we will have a centralized uh, district COVID-19 team looking over that data every day for where we have uh, staff coming in, where the attestation, and again, about hotspots uh, is really one of our critical uh, items in addition to not just filling out the attestation information. Thank you. Okay, Director Rankin. Yeah, my question is because the recommendation is starting remote, is there opportunity another time to uh talk about these things when they are not theoretical when they're actually may be happening i uh it, it yeah when when is the opportunity when we move phases when these things will be more uh actual instead of just one day maybe when will we when it will it come before the what, what's the opportunity for the board again to sort of with staff go over specifics Because right now it seems like we need to get information to OSPI that there is a plan. And Liza, Liza, because the point of today was to go over this this document for OSPI. We are doing what we were supposed to do. So I we will as it's a living document per OSPI. We will come back to it as we need to revise it. I I just want to make sure we're going through this document as we've all described and asked the district to do. I, I guess I'm asking more about the questions that we're asking, getting into very, very specifics that really can't be answered till we are at the point where we're using these things. Well, in the absence of a question, do you have anything further before we move to Director Rivera-Smith? I guess not. Thank you. Director Rivera-Smith. Um, thank you. And thank you for all that information, uh, Wyeth um, and Fred um, and everyone else who I might have forgotten about already. There's a lot of coverage we just did there. So I want to go uh, back to one thing you mentioned about the, um, the attestations. You said there are five questions that are asked in that self-check. I would like to hear what those five questions are. Yeah, so we that, uh, start off. Is that critical Sorry. to the five or well, it's going to lead to, I mean, I wanted to hear what they were because my, my second, my question to that uh, would be, and I guess I can just skip to the <laughs> question, was about the temp checks. It's one of those questions, a temperature check, um, Chief Jesse. Yeah, direct, uh, yes, uh, Director Rivera-Smith, uh, one of the five questions is about your temperature. Have you had a temperature in addition to your own exposure? So we really look to, to say, hey, are are you not feeling well? It's not just about temperature. Uh, some people could be asymptomatic. We've actually had a situation very much like that. Uh, one of our employees didn't have it necessarily a temperature, wasn't feeling well. So are you feeling well? What do you have? Uh, cough, fever, fatigue, headache, some of the symptoms that we know are in association with COVID-19. Uh, then as I said, we do talk about a temperature and we talk about a higher temperature. So we, have, we give specific temperature or higher then is that they've been around anybody that's re required to be uh, quarantined uh, for them, um, uh, themselves or others uh, in relations to their household. Um, so um, those are the, uh, uh, you know, the, the questions that we ask uh, uh, in relations to uh, each of the annotation questions, the five annotation questions. 
Thank you. So my concern is if um, um, staff members do not have a thermometer at home and they cannot uh, adequately or accurately say if they had a temperature or not, are there at the points of entry of schools um, going to be, they're going to be staffed with screeners too? So, so one pause here. For this is the exact thing we're trying to avoid. We are talking about this document and now we are getting into specifics in the weeds about a future time. And I want to be thoughtful that the moment we asked for today from SPS was to focus on this template of 24 questions. That feels very specific to at a point we come back to needing to utilize temperature check. I, I understand. Um, I to me this this covers um, the health screening question number five. So that's what I was specifically trying to find out more about. Um, if you don't feel that that is appropriate at this time, I will move on to other questions because um, I did have other questions too. Uh, not trying to step on your toes here, Director Vera Smith. Just if we go by question, it says we have a daily health screening plan in place for students. You have to click yes. The district is saying yes. That's what okay, I want to And this question is questions before. about the screenings. Yeah. And my questions were just to find out more about that screening and the process of that screening. Again, um, I'm, I'm happy to move on. Okay. Um, so my other question then was for number, then question number. Um, Eight, about frequent hand washing. Have we done an inventory of sinks to ensure that we, I hear that signage is up, um, assuming the signage is in multiple languages. And I, for that, then again, wanted to know if we can ensure that we have um, the sinks we'll need for even the minimal amount of students and faculty, which may be in the buildings at the beginning. Um, this is Chief Operations Officer Podesta. We have, um, uh, gone through the whole inventory of hand washing sinks throughout the district to make sure they're all operational and we identified an additional 35 we felt we needed um, in buildings and are in installing those as we speak and it, um, inspect, expect to be done um, by the end of the month. Thank you. Um, no further questions at this time. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we have a very large section coming up. So I'm gonna to move to part two, which is statutory education requirements, Superintendent Juno. So I'm gonna ask, we go through the full section and then we'll ask questions after number 17. That sounds great. Thank you, President DeWolf. Okay, this is Chief uh, Human Resource Officer Clover Cott. I believe I am going to be attending to questions 13 and 14. So, in number 13, we are required to have a 180 instructional day calendar that is board approved that um, we actually do have in place that has currently three additional days. Right now we call them snow days, although in a remote model, snow would not necessarily be a reason for us closing school. But there could be other reasons such as power outages or network outages that would require us to not be able to provide remote service learning to our students and would require us to close. Um, we are currently negotiating a calendar that would add more days into that should we need them. But the answer to this number 13 is we do currently have a calendar that meets these requirements. So moving on to number 14, we are also required to um, put forward and describe a typical weekly schedule for students at the elementary, middle, and high school levels that demonstrates to OSPI that we are able to meet the 1,027 instructional hour requirement throughout the year, um, and also shows in that weekly schedule that there would be time for professional collaboration for staff to be able to collaborate and plan. You will see that we have, um, in what we have presented, in each of our elementary, middle, and high school schedules, you will see a Wednesday that provides for that additional collaboration with, um, with uh, the employees that are working in our schools, our educators. There have been a lot of questions about our illustrative schedules and what they actually mean and what it means in terms of screen time for younger students in terms of what's developmentally appropriate. And I think there has been some confusion what we are trying to show in the schedules that we have put forward is that um, a we are able to meet the 1027 instructional hours hours through a combination of what would we would call synchronous or live instruction and asynchronous or independent offline learning activities 
Um, you will see that there are consistent start times, consistent lunch times, so that families and students are able to access a consistent schedule across the district. However, um, one of the things that I think there has been some misunderstandings about is that obviously these schedules would need to be tailored for the individual needs of the schools and the students. Um, so there is flexibility within the parameters. Uh, you will also um, see that, for instance, in an elementary school schedule, we've got an, an ELA or a literacy block, a math block, a social studies block, those are not um, meant to, to be shown as if students would be in a whole class live environment for the entire block. That is meant to show that the teacher um, is um, accessible during that block. For instance, let's just take a reading block or an ELA block in an elementary, even if say a first or second grade classroom. If the block says from nine to 10 that the ELA instruction is occurring, the teacher might log on with her whole class for the first 15 or 20 minutes to do the direct instruction live with everybody. We ca sometimes call that a mini lesson, um, at which point students might be reading independently, not on screen, and the student is working with smaller groups of students um, to be able to provide additional guided reading supports or do a shared reading lesson. The ELL teacher, uh, bilingual teacher, might come into the classroom at that time and work with a small group of students the teacher may also be working with students in a one-on-one -on -one fashion, listening to them reading, understanding their reading comprehension and providing feedback. But that block is not meant to be for the whole class, it is definitely meant to be flexible so that the needs of the students can be met. So you will see that we've got elementary, middle and high school schedules that are illustrative in nature. Um, at the secondary level, we're looking at the three periods of day um, and that is a combination of synchronous live instruction and asynchronous or independent offline learning activity so that we can get to that, that OSPI mandate of 1,027 hours throughout the school year. Um, and I believe with that, I will pass over to question number 15 for Chief Wife Jesse. Good afternoon again, Wyatt Jesse, Chief of Schools Continuous Improvement. This particular question retains, uh, pertains to daily attendance for all students, regardless of the teaching modality. Since we are coming back in a remote learning platform, uh, we will be provided uh, just late breaking news uh, updates uh, in the WAC 392401 by OSPI. Um, so um, it was in accordance with uh, the items that we had drafted around our own attendance procedures. For us, for our attendance procedures, we want to make sure that we're providing flexibility in how we are exactly assessing whether a student is attending for any given day. Uh, while we will have an ability to take attendance of whether a student was on synchronous or live instruction, we will also be providing flexibility uh, and accounting for attendance. If any student is engaging with any of the materials uh, within uh, either synchronous, again, live or asynchronous uh, uh, lessons, posted lessons on any of Schoology, um, or also just in conversations through phone, email, uh, or uh, teams uh, with our uh, students. Uh, so they're, again, engaging with materials, the learning materials uh, or tasks. And that would be done for each day. Um, also, uh, providing the guidance is there's a, quite a long list of items for uh, that would be unexcused for any items around attendance, such as uh, illness for themselves, a family member, a parent work schedule, or access to internet. So any of those kind of challenges, amongst some others, uh, they'd be unexcused. Procedure really, uh, in a more um, streamlined way for me to explain it, would be for the, again, the teacher to take attendance through both uh, the opportunity for students to engage, whether that be uh, live or posted materials. Then if they're not, then this teacher would reach out, find out what is uh, going on for the student. Uh, may need assistance from office personnel. So where we hand it off, 
some of that would change for within the district, depending on the size of the school and also for us around uh, elementary and secondary. Uh, and then working through the questions. We also have a tiered model as part of that. So why, what's going on for the student? We obviously have a host of different reasons why students may be engaging with lessons, a lot that be it live or those materials that are posted. And so a team of professionals uh, through a tiered support model at each site, will work through a process of inquiry to find out what is needed by the student and or their family to help further engage with materials. I think that's part of the continuous or infinity loop for uh, us to better our instruction and our supports so they can meet the needs of, again, our students and families. And I'll turn it over uh, for question 16 to Chief DeBacker. Good afternoon. This is Diane DeBacker, Chief Academic Officer. I will be reviewing questions 16, 17, and 18. 16 is all about learning standards, asking if we have identified learning standards across grade levels and or content areas to ensure instructional time and professional learning are effectively tied to our reopening plan. Yes, we have identified learning standards. We are calling those our priority standards. As you can imagine in a year long course, whether you're in third grade or whether you're in a, a high school a content a subject a class, um, there are lots of standards throughout the year. So we will be identifying priority standards as we begin the school year. Uh, we are doing that in collaboration with our CANI team, with our content managers, with our special ed professionals, um, and others to identify what standards we need in order to get the school year started. And then we will roll out the next set of standards that should be priority throughout the school year. So that will be a constant cadence for us of identifying priority standards and then letting our educators know when the next standards are coming along and what they are. For question number 17, it's asking if we've determined our 2021 grading policies. Yes, we have determined those. And as explained in the template for our elementary grades, that's K through five, we will utilize our grade level student progress reports. Uh, these are the same progress reports and the standards marking that we have used in the past that we use during school closure. Um, Included with those standards marking are um, robust comments from the teachers as to how each individual student is doing. For our secondary programs, that's grades 6 through 12, we um, are requesting a change or a, a waiver around the grading policy that we change to a grading policy of A through D. This would mean that we would drop the E after significant engagement with students, with educators, with building principals, um, and with community members, we've determined that the E is not an appropriate uh, mark, especially as we're moving towards an anti-racist organization, um, and it's not culturally responsive. So we are recommending that the E be dropped. So the lowest grade would be a D minus in our current um, recommendation. We do understand that there'll be an amendment to that later today, and we're prepared to respond to that request. Question number 18 is about- Sweet the I'm just gonna uh, actually go ahead. Go ahead and go, start going through 18. Okay. Uh, 18 is about incompletes. They want to know if we have a plan to support our students who received incompletes in the spring now keep in mind the spring of 2020. Yes, we did have a plan for that. As a board, you approved that as we changed our grading to A or I for grades six through 12. Um, and we obviously had that plan in place for the incompletes. It was a successful plan. Uh, we ended up with very few incompletes for our students, um, and most of the students were able to get those incompletes taken care of during our summer school program. I will stop at this point.
Thank you, Dr. DeBacker. OK, so now we are in section two, which is questions 13 with an additional question 18, which corresponds to um, those topics. So we'll go through directors again, starting with Director Hampson. Any questions uh, briefly before we move on to our next section, please? OK, so I'm just going to state very clearly that my assessment here is that we've been presented with versions of schedule, grading, uh, I, I don't know that I can get, let's see, uh, attendance, uh, and there will need to be significant work in these areas with the board going forward. Uh, I remain incredibly concerned about the notion of uh, the uh, 1,027 hours and the use of uh, what is effectively a brick and mortar schedule in a remote environment. And I believe that that needs a lot of work. I know we have uh, policies that we need to look at in order to change start times. Um, but the uh, current um, basis of schedule, I think is not going to uh, really meet the needs of I, I would venture to say the majority of families who don't have the capacity to manage their children in uh, moving them from uh, segment to segment throughout the day because our kids are going, their parents are working, they're going to be in uh, childcare, um, they'll be in community. Um, so we have a lot of work to do on this, and I look forward to doing that work as a board. Um, and this is also um, still uh, being discussed in, in bargaining. Um, so I, I just want to note that, that um, ad any additional questions will come uh, moving forward. But there is a tremendous amount of work to do, particularly on the schedule. And then in terms of attendance, um, I, I, I'm not comfortable with anything uh, that creates a pipeline for truancy and um, calls to CBS. Um, and in any punitive fashion, I appreciate the notion of uh, incredible flexibility in any contact, including just picking up a meal as counting for attendance and uh, that we cannot and that those have to be uh, quote unquote asynchronous. And I, we need to get really careful and clear about using the terms asynchronous and synchronous. They don't mean much to most people. Uh, and, and using real language about whether we're, we're talking about students working independently or students working with a, an instructor or students working with a, a family member. What exactly are those requirements? Um, this is a lot and a very, and then as far as grading is concerned, yes, there is an amendment. Um, I'm very concerned about coming back to, about students coming back to school, being traumatized with the notions of having to catch up, having assessments. Um, that are going to cause problems for them, uh, feeling like they're behind. Uh, we need to make sure that we're welcoming our students back with uh, support, with concern, uh, with connection, and with their well-being in mind. And to the extent that any of these things get in the way of that, we need to back off of them. And um, whether it's elementary school grading or um, middle through high school, um, we, we need to set our students up for as much success as they can possibly uh, gather in this in this coming year, very much dependent on their situation. So I'll leave it to the, the rest of the directors who I know also have concerns here, um, but just know that I do not consider these in any way final. These are a work in progress, and we will be having further uh, conversations about these. Thank you. Thank you, Director Hampson. I, I just caution, I don't think we all need to re- uh, Reshare or re -share our feelings about this being a living document, and yes, we'll, we'll be coming back to this more and more to refine it. So, for other directors, uh, questions for uh, comments or questions on questions 13 through 18, Director Harris. Yes, uh, one of the things that I've heard is that the teachers are going to be using Teams, not Zoom. And recently, this morning, I heard from a number of people that we are not purchasing or asking Microsoft to donate Teams for Educators, which I understand have uh, room for small group instruction. So when we talk about synchronous and asynchronous, and we talk about small group, how is it we're going to do that if our current platform doesn't allow for that? 
Uh, this is Jolyn Berge, Chief for IT and Finance. So, uh, Director Harris, I responded to your email earlier. Uh, there is no special thing that we need to buy as far as Teams goes. We have all the features that you've heard about. Um, the breakout rooms are not active yet. It's something that Microsoft is bringing up in the next um, in the next little bit in their new release. The other features that you um, talked about out are outlined in the email. They're available, but they're also available in Schoology. And I've heard that Schoology is not uh, readily adaptable for the needs of our teachers and principals. Well, I'm, I'm not sure how to comment. I guess I would provide this. LA Unified and, and Tacoma just decided to pick up Schoology after doing RFPs and looks at it. So I'm, I'm not, we'll have to have more discussion. Thank you. Director Hersey. Yeah, um, Chief Jesse, I just wanted to confirm really quickly during the presentation, you, I, I think this is a misnomer, but I wanted to confirm. You said that uh, issues such as access to internet, um, parent work schedule, et cetera, would be unexcused. Did you mean excused? Sorry. Yes, thank you, Director Hearsey. I meant excuse. Yeah, okay. be excuse. Thank you so much. No, no worries. I just wanted to confirm. Okay. And the next thing is that, um, again, with the schedule, I'm not going to go into this harshly, but parents and teachers have been very vocal that, and I just want to make clear that we are wanting to design the schedule so that it works with everybody in partnership with our educators and just make that very clear. We're just not at that point yet. Um, I'm good. We can move on to the next person. Thank you, Director Hersey. Director Mack. Yes, thank you. Um, I just I have a I do have a number of questions, but I think my first one was Chief Jesse. Can you repeat the name of the WAC that just came out related to attendance? Um, and can you also ensure that that's forwarded to all of us for our information? What's the number of that WAC on attendance that OSPI just came out with? Yep, sure can. It's three nine two. Uh huh. Dash 401. 401, okay. Um, and thank you for the clarification that um, there will be excused absences for those things you mentioned. I also had, uh, my my concern was deeply raised by that. Um, with, re with regards to number 15 and the plan to take daily attendance, um, it says very specifically in this thing that we're as a board attesting to is that we have a clear plan for ongoing communication to check in daily, et cetera. And what, I, what I'm hearing is that we have a draft plan, uh, but not it's not solidified yet. And I think I, I also remain concerned and have questions around how we're going to actively support engagement with our students and um, also uh, you know, not lose them in the system, not lose them, just they they just don't show up. And um, and on the financial side, I'm concerned about that from managing enrollment, the AFTE, because enrollment is our budget. Um, and so how we count attendance and ensuring both that we are um, actively engaging our students um, and not, I, I think as uh, Director Hampson was talking a bit about not penalizing them um, and utilizing it as a, um, a method by which we ensure that we are serving our students. Um, so I, I'm not sure how to get there with actually understanding what the clear plan for communication will be other than, I guess my question is when when will we actually see an actual um, proposal of here is the actual communications plan, here's specifically how attendance is going to be taken in each school, et cetera? When, when will we actually have that? So 
also uh, to start up, uh, absolutely want to have strong relationships with our families and students. We are in the business of engaging them, our our customers, to ensure that we can provide an environment that is warm and welcoming, that is identity safe, uh, and that we can meet their own learning modalities and needs um, and hold them to high expectations. You know, those are the things that we've heard through our engagement with families, uh, as well as educators and school leaders. So this, the attendance procedure that we have in place is not meant to be punitive at all. And actually it's meant to be the opposite, to, to provide the flexibility so that where we can have unexcused, I mean, uh, um, to have excused absences uh, wherever possible, but really trying to also just count, it's not, it's not even an absence, right? Like if you're engaging with the materials that we have posted, having a small group conversation, having a conversation with a family about how to support their own learner or to work together. So that's the, the mechanism in which we have set up. Uh, getting that all in writing and finalized really is uh, something that we can move forward and get that into the board next week. Oh, great, thank you for that clarification. My other question is, or just clarification is on the calendar that's posted as a part of the bar. Um, as I read it, that is our current calendar. Um, it's not been adjusted uh, at, at this time. And would, will there be a different calendar submitted to OSPI or is this the one that's gonna be submitted? Director Mack, this is Clover Cod, Chief Human Resource Officer. So what's being submitted? Uh, this right is Chief Jesse. Oh, sorry. Please let, please Chief let Dr. Cod. So this is, this is uh, Clover Cod. So the one that's being presented to OSPI right now, you're correct, is the one that's currently board approved. We are in negotiations with SEA um, with a calendar that would provide for additional um, uh, flexibility in days, but that's um, currently being negotiated. And when we're done with that, we would bring that back to you for approval. Um, and then my, my last question is just for a clarification on the grading policy. Um, are we voting on that today by adopting this? Uh, because I don't see any motion language related to actually adopting a change. I see a waiver in the grading policy, but I don't see an actual adoption of the suggested grading policy. Is there a vote that's happening separately from what's in front of us on that? Uh, this is Greg Narver, Chief Legal Counsel. I'll address that. The, the vote is the one to approve the template and a necessary element of that is a, a waiver of the grading policy. There is not a separate vote scheduled on establishing a new grading policy. What we have today is simply getting approval of the template and that's that's an element of it. So the, the vote is for the resolution and part of the resolution is approval of the template and the, the waiver is called out in the motion but not a separate vote on a, a new grading policy. Okay. Thank you, Director Mack. Director Rankin. Hi, sorry, I couldn't find the button. Um, okay, uh, I uh, thank you to Dr. Cod for um, describing uh, for us a little bit more clarity on what the template schedule is. I think those blocks of times really kind of made people nervous thinking that it was four and a half hours or five hours in front of a screen. Um, so I, I guess I just wanna confirm that um, what, what was said, I think by Director Hampson, that yes, the, the start time is the start time that's in current, current policy and that uh, we don't have to stay with that, but we will have to waive um, transportation standards and there's still time for discussion in the actual, that OSPI doesn't need to know our actual start time. They just need to know that we have a plan to provide the instructional hours. Is that accurate? That is my understanding, Director Rankin. This is Clover Cod speaking. Okay, thank you. So I'm just, also for people listening, like the 755 is not set in stone. That's just what it is in policy currently. So we will still be able to um, talk about that. And I know we've heard from families, um, that 755 is too early and from educators as well. Um, so be looking out for that in the coming 
days and weeks. Um, and then uh, within those hours that the schedule is going to be, the instru instructional hours is defined as educational activity provided by school district staff. That's how the state requires, or how the state defines it. So as Dr. Codd was saying, in those blocks, it could be some live instruction with the full class. It could be small groups. It could be meeting with your IA. It could be independent reading time, as long as it's educational activity that's being provided and guided by the teacher. Um, so I guess I just want to confirm that at the building level, there will be the opportunity for principals and, and building leadership to kind of um, design their master schedule within, if we have a standard start time and a standard end time and a standard lunch time so kids can get food and everything, I'm confirming that there's opportunity for principals and BLT and educators and families to work within that for you know what an ELA block is actually going to be in terms of the experience of the child. That is correct, Dr. Rankin. Great, thank you. Um, and then within that also, I am wondering about where or if we need to talk about it now, and if not, then I'll just, you know, we can wait, but where we can talk about um, flexibility for I don't know, kids whose parents work split shift or something like that, and they're going to, um, you know, never be able to log on at a certain time. Do we have the opportunity to have um, educators flex some of their time? So like one day a week, they they decide just to move, move their teaching time to a different part of the day to accommodate kids that can't be on during the day or... Um, or would there be flexibility for having like kind of um, on call teachers or like a like a help a helpline that Direct kids could call into? Just just let's hold this question because I think this is getting a little bit off off track. Well, thirteen. I'm just no, but I'm wondering like within the flexibility of the template. You know, we don't need to talk about what those are, but do we still have that flexibility? I guess understood to talk about accommodating families and students in other ways director rankin this is clover cod again i think there are definitely conversations about how do we make sure that uh, students can access learning students and families can access the learning knowing that there are a variety of needs um, in within our communities and so making sure that lessons are accessible in um, in Schoology that are posted that can be accessed at different times is absolutely part of the conversation. So I think this is a to be continued conversation, but we are okay. definitely trying to take these things under consideration. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and then attendance I'm uh, uh, director Mack and Hampson cover that pretty well and grading will have uh, an amendment coming forward. So I'm good. Thank you. Thank you. Director Rivera Smith. Was I called on? Sorry, on my phone. Um, yes, sir. Yes, sir. My, my sound ahead. went away for a second. Oh. Sorry about that. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Culver and um, Chief Jesse, for um, clarifying what many parents and teachers needed to hear was that the um, the illustrated schedules were not meant to be taken as the um, solid decision of schedules. I um, appreciate all the information on the flexibility and the control that will be um, had by each individual school site. Um, can you though clarify for me just so that we uh, understand what part of our um, daily schedules are actually determined by headquarters since, since there will be the flexibility in the actual amounts and hours and delivery of subject matter, um, are there parts of those schedules that are determined by um, district headquarters? So I'll, I'll take this is Clover Cod again. I will I will try to try to answer your question. If others want to chime in, please do so. So we determine start times and end times. Um, uh, the sort of the number like the hours within a day. Lunch times is. Um, Typically, you know, in a non-remote setting, those are kind of determined at a school level. But what we're trying to do is have consistent lunch times across the districts for 
ease of accessibility during this um, co time of COVID. Um, and then each school usually has a master schedule. Um, I'm more familiar with elementary schools, whereas the the art, the music, the PE would not all happen at the exact same time in every school. You couldn't accommodate all of the grade levels that way. Same with reading, math, et cetera. Those kind of are fluid um, within throughout the buildings. But what we want to be able to show OSPI in our community is that we do have consistent schedules, consistent start times. That's what we're providing for. We want to make sure students have ac access to 1,027 hours and that there's a minimum level of remote excuse me, synchronous live learning each day and then asynchronous activities. So we wanna provide parameters, but then within that, there's the flexibility at the school level to make the schedule work for the students and the families and the staff. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All, all my other questions were answered yes by other directors. So thank you. Ah. Okay, thank you. Okay, Superintendent Juno, back to you for the remaining questions. Thank you, President DeWolf. I'll turn it back over to Chief uh, Wyatt Jesse. So for question number 19, um, this is around our summer learning program, the Summer to Learn. Uh, this last summer, uh, we had 15,000 students participate, uh, K, K through uh, age 21 in our programming. And so underneath this particular question, what did we have? Uh, also just around targeting supports uh, and learning opportunities who need additional support. Um, about 34% of students who attended uh, summer programming uh, were students who uh, were identified by each of the schools, the 104 schools for additional supports, whether that's uh, uh, specifically to ELA, uh, social emotional learning support uh, or math, uh, in addition to uh, credit recovery uh, that we had at the high school uh, level. So that's about um, a little over 5,000 students uh, who participated and got additional sports this summer when typically we have about, um, about 2,300 students um, in any typical summer programming. I'll leave it to question number 20, I believe Chief DeBacker is gonna take that. Hello, Diane DeBacker, Chief Academic Officer. I'll be discussing um, item number 20, which is if we have a plan to perform a universal screening on each student when they return to school to better understand their strengths, learning needs, and social emotional needs. If you'll recall from when we presented the template um, a few weeks ago, um, we had marked no on this. Uh, since that time, we are able now to mark yes. And our, the reason that we w had marked no originally is we had not uh, had not put a pl pan in, plan in place for the universal screener. As you know, had we been able to return to school in a more of a hybrid model or a face-to-face -face model, we would have been able to use the measures of academic progress um, as one of our choices. And then some schools have other choices as well. Um, but in, in when you approve the measures of academic progress um, a month ago or so, we told you that we would not be recommending those for remote learning and for remote um, testing. And so we're staying with that. Um, and in order to do that, then we had to look at other ways that we can get a good sense of where students are in terms of their, their learning needs. Of course, their social emotional needs, as we've heard Director Hampson talk about, is absolutely at the top of the list before anything else. Um, and so we will be using uh, what we refer to or what's referred to in the field as curriculum embedded assessments. And essentially, with any anywhere that we have an adopted curriculum, usually with adopted curriculum, they have pre and post test. And so, if you think back to the uh, to the good old days of school or the olden days of school, um, where you would take a pre test, and uh, in terms of that subject area, it would be a paper pencil test, um, where it would be very quick. It would be low stakes, non threatening, just to kind of see where you're at. Um, we'll do that at grade level work. Um, so if you're in third grade, we will be um, 
giving some type of uh, an assessment, and I, I use that term loosely, but some type of a, a way that we can measure each student as to whether where they're at with what are the grade level standards are. Um, that's what we will be using um, as long as we're in a remote setting. We do know that there are a few schools that have other things that they've used over the years. Our assessment team and our curriculum assessment and instruction team will work with schools to, to do what's most appropriate um, and maybe what's most familiar to them. But we are confident now that we can answer number 20 with a yes. I'll now hand this over to Dr. Keisha Scarlett, number 21. Sorry about that. Um, okay, I'm, I'm Dr. Keisha Scarlett, Chief of Equity Partnerships and Engagement. And so I'll speak about number 21, about our district's um, developed uh, community, uh, family and community engagement process that includes strategies to reach non-English speaking families to inform our reopening plan. Um, so um, you'll see in the information that we describe a few different engagement strategies um, that um, different folks across our organization, different departments work together in partnership in order to plan for. And so um, specifically, we have been working together with our Department of English um, Language for English Language Learners, our Department of um, School and Community Partnerships, and also our Department of Public Affairs um, in order to improve outreach to ELL families. We received a whole lot of feedback from ELL families, both in conversations and listening sessions, and other um, interviews about just the gaps in um, communication that exacerbate the impact of them trying to support their um, children and have the information that they need. So we convened um, approximately 35 organizations um, to attend a session that included all the people that we described here, so I won't read um, through all of them. And um, it's in order to get some feedback on what are the best practices of how we can really support our um, English language um, families um, to be able to access information for um, their families and for their students. Additionally, um, our public affairs um, division, um, including communications, um, have been working on uh, just nimble outreach tools um, and communication tools to be able to support our families through various modes of um, communication. So one example is the human translation or human language translation for text messages to be able to reach our families. Um, in addition to our current use of school messenger, um, which is used for one-way communication. So how do we ensure that we have two-way communication so that we can hear their feedback? Um, as you um, see in the information, our family communication was sent um, in the top five home languages and also include verbal call and email and text message and also audio recording in order to just reinforce the information that we're trying to get out as well. Um, additionally, our home language web pages and resources continue to have um, translation abilities that families can click on and have the information on the web pages um, translated for them as well. A workflow to disseminate um, talking points and also timely information to CBOs as they are partners um, um, in their accountability to um, our um, POC families and our families who are English language learners as well. We've been working in partnership with them in order to support um, families and help us to build trust and relationship with families as well. What we have represented here um, in our rationale um, here for the um, yes with a for this process is really um, focused on the multiple ways that our departments work together to coordinate um, outreach resources. I want to remind our board that um, that family engagement um, is multifaceted and much of our family engagement is at the school site level that we count on our 104 plus schools to um, to activate um, their family engagement strategies to support families and they are the first lines through our educators and school leaders of communication. Um, what we do in central office is really more community engagement, which our families and students are all a part of that community engagement in our broader community and are always working on different strategies across multiple different partners. So you'll hear from special education or ELL department and from our chief of schools and across our um, entire division, um, all the divisions about how we work to communicate, whether it's about transportation or nutrition 
or a variety of other things um, in that way. So I don't have anything else and I will pass it on to, sorry, I lost my text message. Hi, this is Jolyn Berge. Hey, Jolyn. <laughs> <laughs> I was looking for it. It was away. It's okay. okay. Keep for high tea. <laughs> so question uh, 22 talks about investing in additional hardware software or hardware technology and connectivity. We have done that. We have all computers on order for a one-to-one -one, um, device handout that we will finish these last few weeks into the first part of school starting for our elementary students. It asked us to identify the percentage of students that you believe have right now as of today um, connectivity. We selected the 81 to 90%. We do believe that when we are in the 2021 school year, that will raise up much closer to um, 100%. In B, we have described our strategies. We talk about the different outreach um, that we are doing for hotspots and internet connectivity. Broadband connectivity continues to be an issue in our city and in across the state. So we are working um, with our partners on that. We are also offering a bring your own device option for students who can bring their own device from home and use it. This is something that we have done in our high schools previously. And it's been very successful and you know many of our students like that um, so that option is available as well and with that i will turn it over to chief debacker hello diane debacker chief academic officer i will be responding in part to question number 23 and uh dr cod may also weigh in as as others uh, the question is has our district provided professional learning for our educators to prepare them for the effective instruction during this coming school year. Um, we responded that yes, we have. And we um, initially responded, as you'll see there within the template of the trainings that we provided for our educators during the uh, school closure this past spring. I'll just remind you that in Seattle Public Schools, we have a small digital learning team of eight people strong. Um, and you can see that they provided uh, 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 professional development around Schoology, around how to do remote learning uh, during the spring. Uh, we had a lot of participation, obviously over 1400 educators participated. We will continue to do similar professional learning during tri days. And then as um, I think uh, Dr. Codd will speak about a possible option for some wave days. We've expanded our training beyond just Schoology because we are also offering Seesaw, which is a, a learning management system, a platform for early education for our smallest uh, students or our youngest students, rather K through two and also up through grade five if a school desires that. So we will be adding that into our portfolio of training. We'll continue with the training that we've had around culturally responsive teaching and all of our anti-racist pedagogy series. So we were during 23 with a yes. Um, Dr. Codd, I don't know if you want to speak about the possible waiver days. Um, yes, so not with specificity because we're still in negotiation. This is Clover Codd, Chief Human Resource Officer. But I do want to acknowledge that there is a lot of anxiety um, around being prepared. Educators want to be prepared for the start of this remote school year. Um, and so we owe it to our students and families to make sure that we are providing additional time for professional development to what's already built into our calendar. We know educators uh, need not just time to learn technology platforms and tools, but they also need to learn um, and we need to build in time to make sure we're connecting students and families and providing those social emotional supports for overall well-being um, and professional development in remote instruction and how to create engaging environments in an online world. And so we are currently negotiating for additional time um, that we would like to add into our calendar for the school year. Cannot talk about the specifics. Um, that will be coming out soon. We're very close to reaching a deal with SEA, but wanted to be able to offer that up 
into the conversation so that people can feel um, some sense of assurance that we are going to be offering a much more professional development opportunity to make sure people are re ready for this 2021 remote uh, school year. And I do believe that Dr. Pedroza also has something to add around question 23. Yes, I just wanted to make sure that uh, we are planning professional development for school leaders, case managers, and staff regarding inclusionary practices, specifically targeting general education, the general education setting. Um, and this will also include supports for 504s um, and special education students. Um, and this will include um, everything from uh, in the remote learning setting. And so that is the plan moving forward. So I just wanted to make sure that that was noted in this conversation. Thank you. So I just want to also clarify to our uh, both colleagues on the board and staff, as well as our uh, participants who are listening in on the call, that it is obviously 23 minutes past our scheduled time. So we obviously will be extending our time today. Uh, this typically happens. We are a very uh, curious uh, board. And so uh, we'll be extending our meeting today. Uh, and I appreciate all of your flexibility on that. So now that we've reached the end of the template, let's do a final um, round of questions. Director DeWip, there was one last question, number 24. Director Berge was going to respond. Thank you. I'm sorry. Go ahead. It's all right. Um, so our district has selected primary learning management systems. Uh, those are Microsoft Teams, Schoology, and Seesaw. So that will be where the majority, um, almost all of the work that our students do as far as assignments and connecting with teachers will happen within those platforms. It does not mean that there wouldn't be um, couldn't be some other software that's used, but those will be the main areas for grading and assignments, um, things of that, that nature. That concludes my remarks. Um, back to Superintendent, do you know? Yeah, um, I'm just uh, Director DeWolf. Just want to thank staff and that concludes our presentation and um, I guess you can take it away. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we'll just do final round of questions on those that portion of the template so we can move to the next portion of our agenda. So I'll start again with Director Hampson. Hi there, thank you. Uh, sorry, uh, technical delay. Uh, so uh, Director, I mean, Chief um, Jesse, was the summer school um, participation uh, uh, representative of our demographics? Yes, Director Hampson, the graphic, uh, the demographics uh, that for the particip student participants in our summer programming uh, mirrored very closely to what they are for the entire district. Okay, and I've made, um, thank you, I've made my concerns about assessments clear, so I'll leave that to other directors to um, go into further. And um, with respect to uh, community engagement, um, I've, I've heard very strongly from for family um, and community engagement, which are really critical at this time. I know we have a lot more to delve into. Um, this is one of the board's uh, biggest areas of concern. And um, I don't, um, I know that we did some um, outreach um, to uh, English um, language uh, learner families, but we have uh, significantly more to do um, there, there is a, a version of engagement that I think this district is very uh, used to that, that tends to be pretty unidirectional. I know that we're looking at putting things in place to um, make communication two-way. Uh, we have a lot of work to do, however, as a board and a staff to make sure that whatever um, belief sets or strategies that we have at the um, board and, um, and central office level are actually resulting in supportive engagement um, strategies at the student level. And I believe we're a long way from that. And so I look forward to um, doing more of that work. Um, and thank, I, I do want to give, um, our, our tech team um, has been working really hard to get um, devices in, in hands um, and um, has been doing some pretty substantial uh, uh, family engagement during the last um, month or so that I've, I've been happy to, to see directly. Um, I, I'm going to be um, continuing to bring up um, as we get further into this that there are um, issues around digital literacy, uh, connectivity, 
um, uh, consistent access, whether it's to internet service or just a safe, quiet um, place to actually participate in, in a remote um, setting. And then in other cases, the notion of the remote situation is just simply not going to work for, for some students. And so while, you know, in an ideal world, we would be able to, to get to 100%, I want to stay really realistic that that's not where we are. Um, and despite our, our staff's really strong efforts to um, push both connectivity and um, devices out to, to all families, we're going to have to work very hard in a number of other um, areas and, and, and build other capacity that allows us to stay connected to students outside of tech. Um, and I will leave it to my fellow directors. Thank you, Director Hampson. And I just, if folks could please uh, stick to 19 through 24 here, and we'll go to Director Harris next. I'd like to pass, but be recalled on at the end of the line here. I'd like to listen to my fellow directors. Thank you. Understood. Director Hersey. Yeah, I have no questions on this section. Thank you. Thank you. Director Mack. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, uh, I think two questions. One about the uh, tech rollout and supports. Uh, when will families learn about uh, those um, distribution plans? Do we have a plan that that's going to come out in the next week to families, or um, when when is that going to happen? Because school is due to start and not too long from now. So I'm curious to know when the distribution plans are going to head out to families so that they can get their devices. Uh, this is Jolyn Bergen. I'm in, so middle schools and high schools really have that plan. They ran those um, device handouts a, a lot in the spring. Those plans are pretty well in hand for those schools. We'll be assisting the elementary schools in standing something up. We're currently in the process of working um, across departments with school supplies and other things that we know have to be handed out at the same time as well as forms. So we're still working on exactly what that will look like, but we'll be modeling off of the spring laptop handouts and device handouts that we did. So we'll be moving it to the elementary schools in a similar fashion, but wanting to try to do it all at once. Okay, great. So that'll, that information will be coming out soon once the full plan gets put together. I appreciate that it's a lot of uh, complicated work. I do want to point out, though, that I'm not, I, I've, I've seen concerns around middle school and high school students that um, have not accessed their technology because they didn't perceive it to be um, that they were students furthest away from educational justice, and they've been told by principals that they've all been handed out. Um, so uh, if we are one to one, I, I think that we actually may be in a place where there are students that need devices that aren't um, that haven't gotten them yet in middle school and high school as well. So yep. I just want to make that we, point. Yep. Okay. What, they were okay. opened up to everyone at the end. I think that um, we we know we have some more work to do and we need to finish up with those students. So that really okay. is going to be a a check in with each student to make sure they have what they need and they're connecting online. That'll be part of what we're asking, um, just our entire system, how to support the family and student. Excellent, thank you. Um, and then uh, my other question is around family and community engagement. And uh, it's kind of a two-part question around whether or not we're ensuring that we have at every school um, someone in the, the role of counselor, social worker um, slash family engagement support worker um, at every one of our schools to support families in addition to the principal. Um, I think as others have talked about the, the family engagement uh, from our schools often is very one way and it's through um, a, either their educator, their direct teacher or the principal and there's varying levels of engagement there. And especially in this remote environment, um, it seems critical to me that that we would at every school have another person on point and identified as um, a person to go to for family engagement questions um, that would help support the educator and the principal. Um, but I also know that we're not funded to have a counselor at every school. So uh, A, 
do we have a possibility of having a point person identified that has that role um, at all of our schools? I guess, and I should have said B, but I, I'm sorry, that's that's A is my, my main question. Do we have the ability to do that at all of our schools? That's not just the educator or the principal. So Wyeth, I'm wondering if you could talk about maybe the attendance support teams and the MTSS teams that we kind of have supporting our students. I, because Director Mack, you're right, we don't have funding to fund all of those positions. And MTSS yeah. teams are not in existence at all of our buildings. There's only, I mean, a third have MTSS teams. Um, so, yeah. Well, well people, so, uh, so, again, hi, good afternoon. YHSE Chief of Schools of Continuous Improvement. So, um, uh, for accuracy, every, every school uh, has a tiered support team they may call it something different so not everybody calls it the same thing but the purpose is around providing supports uh to students and families as as needed you know based on a continuum of supports i think the question you're really raising is around engagement and who's responsible for it and so yeah the school leader we rely significantly and heavily on them and their expertise to connect we also know that our our office personnel connect tremendously with our students. They often know a lot of the, the background, the, the stories, uh, the strengths and the needs of our families. And then I, I think the piece that I would add is everybody's responsible for that, that it really is a team approach. No one knows all things for a particular student. And so when we, when we work in a team uh, environment, uh, whether that's at the grade level or department, along with integrating EL, L supports, uh, special education, a counselor, an FSW, some of the people you mentioned, Director Mack, they all are responsible. So that's what we've set up this this fall. We would also set that up for if we were to come back um, in some kind of, you know, whatever, if we were to change into a hybrid or, or you know, whatever we look for after COVID-19. But that that is, that's everybody's responsibilities to engage families. Uh, I uh, thank you for that answer. I think that um, I, I think I've, I kind of remain concerned that we don't that, that families also need to know another point person. Um, and so I appreciate. Thank you for the answer. I'm done. Thank, thank you. you. Director. Yeah, thanks. Um, I have two quick questions, I guess. Can, is is there opportunity? Uh, I have questions. I want to know more about the universal screening, but I know that that's not that doesn't need to happen now. There is a plan. I would just like to learn more about it. And is there opportunity for us to do that in committee or in another meeting? Um, this is uh, Chief DeBacker. Um, we. Uh, we can provide as much information as you need in when whatever format, probably not here since you're pressed for time. Yeah. Uh, we could even discuss it in CNI next week if you prefer. That would be great. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then the uh, other question about the, well, uh, professional learning uh, for educators, um, I, I don't know if it's really a yes or a no because it's have we already provided and we've had it looks like we've provided like a little bit but there's a lot of educators that wouldn't be covered by all that and we will be providing it so is it fair to say yes um this is this is Chief, yes. um, chief human resource officer so i think it's fair to say yes because we have i think the wording of the question definitely should be will you be so I think the answer to both of those is yes. Yes, we have, we have okay. offered, we've had over 1400 educators participate in that, but we also have a comprehensive plan to make sure by start of school, we have provided consistent professional development for our educators so that they are ready for a remote instructional model. 
Thank you. And then the last question, learning management system, I understand is about primary learning management system, but there was a comment that uh, Chief Berge made about that there could be others. So is that at the discretion of the building or will there be other processes by which the district approves other possible um, programs? Hi, this is Chief Berge. Uh, so we have an approval process now and there is approved uh, software that's listed on our website. We look at student security and we look at ADA accessibility as two main components before that they're allowed to be used in the classroom. I just wanted to say that while those are our main base systems that everyone's going to have to use, there, it's not an exhaustive list of nothing else ever will be used in the classroom. That's the point I was trying to get across. Okay. Thank you. All right, Director Rivera Smith, close us out with any uh, questions, comments before. Actually, you, you'll go and then I'll, I'll call on Director Harris uh, to close us out. Thank you. Um, my question is regarding number 23 on this about professional learning. Um, I'm hearing from, I'm hearing concerns from our ESAs, uh, which are our educational staff associates. For those who don't know, our nurses, our speech therapists, occupational therapists, psychologists, teachers for the deaf, um, concerns that the trainings offered are, are actually not relevant to the work they do. Um, so I'm wondering if there is a plan to engage with them on what would be appropriate for their work and to be offered for that. Director Rivera-Smith, this is Clover Cott again. So yes, this is actually being negotiated. So I don't want to talk about specifics, but absolutely, yes, we are addressing these concerns within the context of negotiations. Thank you for that. Uh, no, no further questions at this moment. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Director Harris, close us out with this section. Terrific. Thank you. I just heard comments that uh, we're going to circle back around for folks with uh, device needs. Are, are we asking the principals in each school to do that? Yes, they'll be helping. We'll all be helping together. Okay. And comment on Chief Jesse's comment that everyone is responsible. Um, if everyone is responsible, the old adage is, is that no one is responsible. Are we going to uh, designate a point person for each school to address the connectivity issues, the uh, attendance issues, et cetera. Where does the buck stop? Accountability is a very, very uh, highly uh, held goal for this board. Uh, this is Chief Wyatt Jesse for schools and continuous improvement. Uh, I would say Director Harris, uh, we've had this conversation many times over and, and I agree accountability is really important uh, for some there's different items that that were raised on here uh, one of those uh, that you mentioned was around the distribution of devices uh, which uh, Department of Technology Services will be helping to coordinate with the school sites and going down a checklist but for the attendance as I mentioned earlier was that we were going to put those things out we have dedicated teams. The ultimate person that's responsible for attendance at each school site per procedure is the is the principal. And then the oversight is going to be done, performed by central office. So we'll be also monitoring in central office for the attendance uh, for students. And, and who will be the point person at uh, central office for that? Uh, you, you could go right to me. Okay, and my last question is, is it true that the principals have not been distributed the playbook as yet? That is correct. And what is the ETA on that? That that concerns me greatly. Since we needed to leaders, have, I, yep. I haven't voted on anything, so. Yep, exactly. Yep. We had Thank to wait you. for today. Yep. Okay. Thank you everyone for your great questions. Um, now that we've come to the uh, next portion of our agenda, I'm going to, excuse me, just making sure I have all my notes here. So 
we we will now move to the discussion on amendment number two, which will be a verbal amendment from Director Rankin, Director Hersey, and myself. So, Director Rankin, may I have a motion for this amendment, which for our audience will be, and for, and for the record, will be identified as Amendment 2. Can you make that motion, please? Yes, I can. Sorry. <laughs> I was trying to find the right. Um, and, and President uh, DeWolf, is it possible to get uh, somebody to scribe the language onto the screen so we can see it? Um, it's it, It's quite difficult to have an amendment that uh, I, I can't read as well. Just hearing it verbally is going to be really challenging. Well, let's let's hear it and then let's see what we need to do. Director Rankin, please step in now. Yes, I move to amend the 2020-2021 reopening plan template by replacing the first sentence of the answer to the portion of question 17 regarding high school grading which states A through D or incomplete are the proposed grading options. Uh, so I move to replace that sentence with the following language. A through C minus or incomplete are the proposed grading options. The second sentence would remain as written. And to the extent that this amendment conflicts with information provided in, presented in the bar, the amendment would control and um, override what's in the bar. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. This Director. is Director Hampson. Oh, thank you. Okay. Who has been moved by Director Rankin and seconded by Director Hampson. Director Mack, would you still like the, uh, the wording put up on the screen? Uh, yeah, it, it, it would be helpful. I mean, we haven't seen this. Uh, this wasn't presented in advance of the meeting and the first I'm hearing of it. So I'm uh, yeah, seeing the actual language. If I just could uh, uh, verbally state back to you what I understood is that in, in summary, the amendment is proposing that the grading policy would be A through C, uh, dropping the D um, and maintaining incomplete. Yeah. So current currently the the what was in the template says A through D or incomplete with the removal of the E and our my amendment is to remove the D as well. Um, I don't feel like we should be giving students D's in a pandemic and if they're at risk of getting a D then we need to engage and make sure that they have the support and access to education that they need to um, pass with. Uh, with a C minus or above. Thank you. OK, so. Uh, if I can ask our board staff to support by uh, adding the language to the screen, just so Director Mack can see it. Uh, Director Rankin, I will turn it to you for any additional comments you want to brief us on before I turn it over to, to directors quickly here. Any other? Um, no, basically just in thinking about the um, last year's temper or la the spring's temporary policy of an A or an I, and knowing that for a lot of people that didn't um, that uh, was not robust enough, and now that we have expectations being raised on 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 students, on teachers, on the district, etc., um, and more standards to meet, uh, I, I just still don't want anyone students being penalized, <coughs> struggling to connect, or having a hard time. Um, getting what they need in a remote setting, and and I think that uh, I'm I'm worried about losing students and not having them be prepared for uh, whatever comes next for them if we allow D's. Understood. And um, that discussion was had uh, with um, uh, fellow curriculum instruction member Director Hersey. And then with you, um, Director uh, Zach <laughs> DeWolf. <laughs> and and I, I want to add, too, that we've had some other conver larger conversations about wanting to just examine grading and standards based versus letter grades, et cetera, um, as is rooted in our values as a district and what we want to tell 
you know, what we want students and teachers to be working on, but there's not time for that right now, but we can remove the, um, the potential punitive mark of the D. Thank you. Okay, so now directors for any quick comments or questions on amendment two before we move to the vote, we'll start with director Hampson. Uh, no, just to confirm, I think this is the just one tiny step towards um, a, a more equity focused uh, grading policy. We know that we have a lot more work to do, and I was happy to hear that staff is interested in doing that work, particularly as it pertains to middle school. I think that this is um, a, a good uh, starting point for the current um, situation we're in. So thank you for uh, putting, putting this together. Thank you. Director Harris. Yeah, I'd like to go back to one of the answers we got from staff as far as how many incompletes last spring and how many folks rectified those incompletes and where we stand now. And I'd also like to know if part of this motion, correcting or addressing the incompletes is addressed. Uh this is uh, Chief DeBacker, uh, President DeWolf, would you like me to respond? That sounds great, please do. Thank you. Um, Director Harris, we um, had fewer than 30 incompletes from the spring. Um, so fewer than 30, many of those were addressed through summer school. I do not have an exact number of how many of those 30 were addressed. Um, but we can find that out. Um, if we, we felt very good about that the, the incompletes that did come into summer school were able to, to be able to be taken care of. So because we have the process in place, it will change a little bit during, uh, during this coming uh, semester, um, whether we would go with a D grade or the C minus grade. Um, but uh, the process is in place. The educators uh, were able to uh, figure out plans for students. So we're, we're competent with the incompletes as we had them at this point. So what is the plan for curing the incompletes then, please? Uh, the plan for curing the incompletes is uh, similar to what we did during the spring in that if a, at a certain point during the semester, uh, we, uh, a teacher is aware that a student may be moving towards an incomplete. They will notify their building level administrator that that is that may be coming, so that we can do some some um, some work with the student prior to that time. And then once the student, if the student does is not able to get that taken care of before the end of the semester. There will be an individual plan that each student will work with with the teacher um, in order to get that taken care of. Um, they'll have till the end of the semester to complete that plan. So then my next question in terms of accountability as to which schools are having issues with this, does it go from then the principal to the ed directors? Or does it go to you? It, it's very vague to me. I'm, I'm looking for a punch list, if you will. Yeah, um, the for the spring semester, the incompletes went through the building administrator. Um, and um, I don't believe that the directors of schools were involved with those in terms of individual students. They may have been involved with them in terms of visiting with the principal. But um, any um, incompletes that were still left on the books um, would come to, um, we, we supported the principals and how they could help work those out. So it came to central office um, with more than anything as advice as to how we can help the student. The, the, Thank ed director, you. the ed directors were looped in, but they weren't the final decision point. I don't know if that helps or not. Well, then who was the final decision point? Final decision point at this point was with the building administrator. So we could have a continuum of different approaches throughout then, is that correct? There's no fundamental baseline. 
I'm, I'm thinking about how to answer that question. Uh, yes, with, with each individual principal, it could be different, but we feel like with the process that we put in place prior to even getting to that point with the decision, uh, that there were enough safeguards in place that there was a, um, there was, there was a system process around it up to that point. Thank you. Thank you, Director Hersey. Yeah, thanks. So this was a, <clears throat> a really uh, robust conversation that we had um, amongst uh, Director Rankin and I. Uh, I just want board directors to remember, like, mathematically going into this next semester, a 1.0 that you get from a D is still incredibly detrimental, <clears throat> excuse me, incredibly detrimental to a student's GPA. And so as we're thinking about this, again, wanting to act from the perspective of doing as little harm as possible, but also giving space to get clear and accurate feedback, I think that this pushes us a little bit closer, as Director Hampson was mentioning, to equity for every student. What I also want to see is that as we come back at whatever situation outside of COVID, that we use the same approach that we were doing for in complaints for E's and D's moving forward. This is the type of support that we need to be giving to our students to ensure that they have all of the resources and academics needed to be successful going forward into whatever pathway they choose post-graduation. So those are my thoughts. I really hope that we can get there on this resolution because this is what is going to be best for our students. Thank you, Director Hersey. Director Mack. Um, I, I'm, you know, just having this uh, brought to my attention now. Um, I, I haven't had a ton of time to think through it, but I, you know, I, I think the district staff uh, uh, in proposing the A through D uh, and dropping the incomplete may have pondered whether or not we should also drop the D. So I'm kind of one, can, if, and maybe it's Diane DeBacker that can speak to uh, the thought process about uh, why maintaining A through D um, made the most sense, as opposed to also dropping the D in the district's proposal. Yeah, uh, Director yeah. Matt, this, this is Diane DeBacker, Chief Academic Officer. And uh, we, as we had a lot of engagement around this in the in the past couple months. So we engaged with our our secondary principals. We had students from um, AAMA. We had students from the Superintendents Advisory Count Group. Um, we engaged with the um, the PSTA. Um, all around different options, and we did consider an A through C. But the main reason that we did not recommend it for this is we were concerned that it might lead to more incompletes. And um, so, so that was our main concern. But also, as we looked at the amendment that has been presented here, and we've had a, we've had a little bit of time to look at this, Director Rankin was was uh, very early in, in um, alerting us to this possibility. So as we've looked at this though, we put it back on ourselves and I think it's directly what, um, or it's, it's related to what Director Hersey said is that um, just if, it, if we really think that it's gonna lead to more incompletes and we need more things within our system of how we determine grades for individual students, especially students furthest from other educational justice, how we assist them along the way. So we're putting that responsibility back on us as a system and, and saying that we have to put everything in place like we did during the spring. If you think about it, out of a possible number of grades that we could have had of incompletes in the spring, there was a possible 80,000 different grades that could have been an incomplete. We had that down to less than 30. So we can do this. Um, I think uh, we support the amendment um, and we um, commit to working with our, our educators and our building administrators to see that this benefits students. Okay, so thank you for that clarification that you, you you do support this amendment, even with all the engagement that happened previously. 
um, and your uh, existing proposal being slightly different. Um, but just for clarification, the um, accountability measures of managing the incompletes, I don't see that codified anywhere. I see it spoken about, but I'm a little concerned about whether or not that um, plan that we had in place for um, ensuring that we were following up and uh, engaging with those students, that if we don't have it codified or stated, and it's not a part of this amendment, that it might just get lost. And I hear your commitment, but I'm wondering uh, how we can ensure that we have that same um, accountability on the incompletes as we did in the fall. And maybe yeah. that's a process yeah. question because yeah. it's not a part of the amendment, but it's it's a thing that I think does need to be included here. Right, yes, uh, and thank you for asking that. Yes, and if you remember that in the spring you passed the policy and then the staff developed the detailed guidelines, we'll do that the, in, in the same way that we did. We'll look at the lessons learned as we um, for, did that during the spring and make any changes, but we'll develop those processes and we'll get those back to to um, probably through the CNI committee. That's a proper way to address those. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Director Rankin. Oh, excuse me, Director Rare Smith. Thank you, and um, thank you, Chief Tobacco, for clarifying um, your support of the amendment. Um, I, uh, I think everyone covered pretty much um, the benefits of the change, so I have no further questions. Thank you. Thank you. And I also, uh, as a supporter, a sponsor, don't have any more questions at this time. And thank you for cl your clarification, uh, Ms. DeBacker. Um, now that it is the end of this discussion, uh, Ms. Wilson-Jones, please uh, do the roll call vote for amendment number two, please. And, and just to reconfirm, I had Director Rankin moving the amendment and Director Hampson seconding the amendment. Is that correct? Yes. Thank you. Um, then to the roll call vote on amendment two, uh, Director Hersey. Aye. Director Mack. Aye. Director Rankin. Aye. Director Rivera Smith. Aye. Director Hampson. Aye. Director Harris. Aye. Director DeWolf. Aye. This motion has passed unanimously. Thank you very much, Ms. Wilson-Jones, and thank you, directors. Uh, may I have a motion now? We'll move to Amendment 1. So I may have, I have a motion for Amendment 1, which is the proposed substitute resolution number 2020-21-4 from Directors Hampson, Hersey, and Rankin, which, would, which was posted to today's agenda. This is Director Hampson. I move Amendment 1 to the Board Action Report titled Approving Resolution Number 2020-21-4, Adopting a Reopening Plan for the 2020-21 School Year to Substitute Proposed Substitute Resolution Number 2020-21-4 for the resolution attached to the underlying Board Action Report and to the extent that the substitute resolution conflicts with information presented in the underlying board action report, the substitute resolution shall control. Immediate action is in the best interest of the district. Do I have a second? I, I second it. <laughs> okay, thank you. Director Harris was there first. So amendment one has been moved by Director Hampson and seconded by Director Harris. Director Hampson, I will now turn it over to you and the other sponsoring directors to uh, quickly uh, brief us on Amendment 1. Yes, I, I will keep this short. We did discuss this at length uh, last week. I would just um, quickly say that um, this what, what I am uh, proud to present this amendment um, for is the um, intent to provide environments for our students in the coming year where they have the opportunity to connect um, in place-based environments with each other, with their educators, um, to push beyond the uh, limited notion of remote learning and provide um, health and wellness um, for them and uh, connection and provide identity-safe opportunities 
for them to uh, access some portion of their of their um, academic health through this next year. Um, and I'll turn it over to my fellow uh, sponsors. Yeah, I'll go ahead and hop in here. Hi, this is Director Hersey. I think that you know, as we have shopped this potential resolution around with so many various community groups, I think that initially it's very clear that the reception is mixed, but the more we have conversations around what we are envisioning for this, to be built in partnership with educators, to be uh, operationalized at every individual building, and to have a broad definition of what outdoor education is so that that can be worked and maintained in um, <clears throat> an accessible and a uh, sustainable way for each building, really the reception is, this is a really a great idea. I am recalling um, a conversation that I had with new vice principal, or excuse me, assistant principal, Annie Patu over at Rainier Beach around some of the great work that they were doing um, with connecting with their students in a socially distant way on Fridays during uh, the summer program at Franklin High School. And that sounds a lot like outdoor education to me. And what I really just want to emphasize again for the rest of our board is that this is an opportunity for us to really be thoughtful about how important and critical those interpersonal relationships are, especially in terms of education. Education. And if we do not start having conversations about uh, a plan to get this done in partnership with our union and the rest of our staff in our buildings, then we are doing our children a vast disservice because I'm telling you, as a teacher, it will not work if we do not have a plan at some phase, not at the beginning of school. Let me make that clear as well. This in no way is happening at the beginning of school. <laughs> so I just want to be, again, very clear that this is an opportunity for us to do right by our students. Thank you. Director Rankin, any final word before I move to other directors? Um, yeah, just really quickly, I've seen, um, you know, people sort of refer to this as the outdoor school proposal. And I just wanted to say that, you know, while outdoor school is definitely a component, really at the heart of this is, is adhering to the requirements you know, necessary of the um, template from WASDA of the resolution that we need to pass today. It, it covers all of those things and sort of goes further to insist that as we move through this ever-changing um, situation that we're all in, that we all work together to find ways for community to be together, for community to tell us what they need, um, that we know that being outside is, uh, is safer is, 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 is less risky than being inside. Um, and, and also that movement is so critical for students. And so I just, um, it's really kind, I'm kind of thinking of it as like the whole child, whole community place-based resolution that involves outdoor learning. Um, but just to say that it's not in opposition to the, the other resolution that was, that's being presented today, it's, it's in addition, and it really relies on um, giving agency to communities and support from the district so that we don't find ourselves in a situation where some school communities, some teachers, some families are kind of going at it on their own and um, and providing opportunities in a way that's not equitable because um, it's, it's everyone for themselves instead of all of us together. So that's basically what this is about. Thank you, uh, directors. Thank you, excuse me. Thank you, sponsoring directors uh, and cre creators of this. Uh, resolution substitute. So I'm going to move to the uh, other directors on any final comments or questions on this item. And we'll start with Director Harris uh, first. Uh, thank you. First of all, I want to say a huge, huge thanks to the sponsors of this resolution and watching it be fine tuned and being um, changed definitely been an iterative document and uh, those iterations are much, much appreciated. I am a huge advocate of more outside body time of environmental education, et cetera. And I agree with Director Rankin, this is not just the quote unquote outdoor school resolution. Uh, but, I, but I have to say that I'm hugely disappointed in the communication between senior staff and the board of directors on a number of issues. Number one, 
the fact that ethnic studies has been a high priority for this board for several years and we have not moved forward on it. And that is in fact embedded in this resolution. And I really wanna see a plan on that. We have stumbled, we have, um, we have not met the need and now we're adding black studies to this, which I absolutely agree with, but we can't do this the way we've done it in the past. And, and, it's, and it's unacceptable, quite frankly. The other issue is community schools. On paper, it looks like a great idea. But in four and a half years, I have yet to see a spreadsheet or a list of the community-based organizations that work with the school district. Yes, I appreciate that's over 250 folks. That's okay. Your school board can read a spreadsheet of over 250 organizations. And moreover, uh, how we deal with those community-based organizations, whether we cut them off at the knees in an arbitrary and capricious manner that we have in the last couple of years is highly, highly important. And we've got a whole lot of policy work to do on that. With respect to the task force, you betcha, right on, could not agree more. Second, um, with respect to having real partnerships with the city of Seattle and the joint operating agreement with the Seattle Parks Department, critical issue. And frankly, those have not been very attractive in the past. And I wanna see how that's gonna change. The other is, um, we, we need to absolutely call it out and work through it. Um, I, I am beyond impressed with the work that's gone into this. I agree that this is an opportunity, but, but again, the devil's in the details and the execution of these ideas as opposed to platitudes. Thank you. Thank you, Director Harris. Director Mack. Um, yes, thank you. I, I appreciate the clarification around, around that this this resolution is not just outdoor school. And I want to I want to help highlight some of the therefore be it resolved uh, portions that are I think really helpful and important to be stating clearly. Um, the first of which is being that there's uh, I, there's going to be two task forces uh, to support this work. One for the superintendent and one for the board. Um, both of those uh, groups and having that um, engagement um, is going to be incredibly important and helpful to our work. Um, additionally, I think making the statement that uh, we are uh, partnering with our uh, community alignment initiative partners and um, supporting child care options in that manner um, is incredibly important. Um, Additionally, that the um, pilot programs are for outdoor and community schools are pilots, and um, that uh, you know the consideration of health and safety needs, et cetera, are going to be uh, considered in those pilots, and it's 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 not a requirement across the district. I think that's very, uh, uh, I think that's a great thing that that got clarified here. And um, lastly. Uh, you know, from my operations hat, uh, the um, joint use agreement with Seattle Parks and Rec uh, being um, revised appropriately uh, to support all of these efforts um, is needed. So um, appreciate um, all of those different clauses in this resolution. Thank you. Thank you so much, Director Mack. Uh, Director Rivera Smith. Thank you. Um, yeah, very appreciative also as well of um, the co sponsors for this resolution. Um, I I look forward to those task force doing the work that will bring about implementation of this for our schools and for our students. Um, I'll, I'll be honest. My only my only um, my only concern at all is um, with the um, 
the pilots that can begin as early as this school year, um, you know, for a resolution that I, I, I know can really center on equity and our students focus from educational justice. I don't, what I don't want to see though is that for only well supported and well resourced schools to take advantage of this early on right now when school starts um, by being able to coordinate um, a pilot at their school. So this will clearly fall then heavily on our schools. We want to make sure that we do the part that says, you know, Seattle Public Schools will support with necessary health and safety protocols, um, these pilots, because we, we want to make sure that it would be an opportunity for any school who um, aspires to get their students outside this school year in, in a capacity that is safe um, and in partnership with their community. Um, so um, that is that is the only part that I, w I really want us to be aware of and keep an eye on um, as this rolls out so that we don't create another inequity where um, we're trying to create more equity. Thank you very much. No further questions. Thank you, Director Vera Smith. Uh, and I have no further questions at this time. I'm very supportive of this resolution. So I will now uh, close out comments and questions from directors and ask Ms. Wilson Jones for the vote on amendment number one. Director Harris. Aye. Director Hersey. Aye. Director Mack. Aye. Director Rankin. Aye. Director Rivera Smith. Aye. Director Hampson. Aye. Director DeWolf. Aye. This motion has passed unanimously. Thank you, Ms. Wilson Jones, for your help. Uh, we will now move back to discussion of the underlying item as amended by Amendment 1 and Amendment 2. So may I have a motion for the underlying item as amended? This is Director Hampson. I move approval of the underlying board action report titled Approving Resolution 2020-21-4, Adopting a Reopening Plan for the 2020-21 School Year as amended, amended by Amendments 1 and 2. Second the motion as amended. Thank you. Thank you, Director Harris. Okay, so this item has been, um, as amended, has been moved by Director Hampson and seconded by Director Harris. We point, of clarification, direct point of point of, yeah, point right. of procedure clarification. The yes, language yes. in the bar also included waive in part the following board policies um to the extent explained in the policy implication and that wasn't read as well as a approve the purchase that, of that, so there's two other pieces of the motion that weren't read yes that was read at the beginning but i guess if if miss wilson jones if you, Do you want me to reread it it's a long time ago sure that'd be, that'd be great just for just for clarity i just want to be for clarification yeah. exactly what the yeah full that's motion a good idea is. so um Thank you. this is Thanks. director hampson so um, the original um, resolution included waiver in part of the following board policies to the extent explained in the policy implication discussion below policy number 2420 high school grade and credit marking and policy number 2015 selection and adoption of instructional materials. Additionally, the approved uh, what about the approve the purchase okay. from approve, Open Up? It also approves the purchase from Open Up Education of Expeditionary Learning Education 6 through 8 ELA curriculum materials and accompanying professional, sorry, professional development for an amount not to exceed $800,000 for an emergency pilot due to COVID-19. So the, the substitute um, resolution, which includes the template, the waiver of the policies, and the uh, addition of the six through eight um, uh, curriculum addition. Ms. Uh, Director Harris, if you want a second one more time, that'd be great. Sure, happy to second as amended, as restated and clarified, thank you. Thank you, this item has been, amended, as amended has been moved by Director Hampson, seconded by Director Harris. Thank you, Director Mack, for uh, a great reminder to add that to the record. We will now move to directors for any final comments or questions on the underlying item package as amended before we move to the final vote. So 
uh, directors. Uh, we'll start with um, Director Rivera Smith. Oh, thank you. Did not expect that. <laughs> um, yeah, um, I, I. So I really wish there was a, a way to um, to acknowledge all the people who put so much time, um, passion, professional hours into the development of all the work that was shared with us today. Um, I, can, I don't know that it's possible to name them all um, by anybody, but I um, just want everybody to know how much it is appreciated and it's um, gotten us to where we are. And it's also not the end, right? We know there's a lot of work ahead. We've talked about how much um, engagement and planning there is still to do for all the questions that are still out there. So, um, but I look forward to that. We look forward to doing that work and being part of those um, work sessions that we've talked about and hope for and plan for and the engagement that comes with that. So just thank you again to everybody for all the um, energy that went into everything we heard today. And um, I have no further comments. Thank you. Thank you, Director Rivera Smith. Director Rankin. Uh, I will just echo what um, Director Rivera Smith just said. I know a lot of people have been working tirelessly, and there's a lot that we don't see and will probably never see in front of us, um, evidence of all of the hard work. But um, just, yeah, just echo her comments and thanks to everyone for for thinking about our students. And 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 um, we are going to just keep keep going. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Director Thank you. Next one to Director Mack. Uh, yeah, thank you. I just want to clarify a few things that I think might be Scribner errors, uh, not Scribner errors, but Scribner corrections. One of the uh, things that we discussed way early on in this meeting about three hours ago was that in number one, under the part one mandatory health requirements, it doesn't state Seattle King County Public Health, and I think it needs to. Um, as long as those, as well as those names of individuals from that agency. Um, and I guess kind of a question slash comment slash, I don't know what, I, I'd like clarification from district staff and um, our executive board team around with these um, items that the plans are kind of broad based and not very specifically identified and things still there's there's outstanding plans. Um, for example, around the, you know, how are we going to be doing enrollment and attendance? Um, the, you know, what's exactly going on in our buildings? Um, and, you know, when we, we open, um, et cetera, et cetera. There's a number of things that are just not as fleshed out the schedule bell times. Uh, whether or not we are going to change those or uh, waive the transportation services standards. Um, when, if we approve this today, what exactly is our board process? Um, and when will those other uh, more specific plans be coming to us? I think uh, Chief Jesse indicated that the enrollment one would be available next week. Um, but the rest of it, uh, do we have weekly? work sessions or weekly board meetings? How are we going to be processing through these additional things that need to need to still be addressed and solidified? Uh, and I don't, I is, maybe, is that a question for uh, the superintendent and our president? I don't know. I'll, I'll let Chief Jesse go and then superintendent and I'm happy to answer or fill in the blanks as well. Yeah, hi, Wyatt, Jesse, Chief of Schools and Continuous Permit. I, I, as I mentioned, I, yeah, for attendance, I will be having the procedure moved out for next week. As also Chief Cod mentioned, some of the items um, we're working with our labor partners to shore some things up. And so some of these items are tied directly to our work with them, uh, i.e. schedules, for example. Yeah, Director Mack, this is Superintendent June. I would just say that I think what we are going to talk through and I'll visit with the president about it is trying to have um, a series of work sessions where we can keep uh, going through the plans as they continue to progress 
you know that there's still a lot of moving parts and then any kind of policy changes and such that need to happen will likely go through a committee process or a board process as well. Okay, thank you. Director, yeah, I will, you know, I'll work with superintendent and um, the committee chairs, particularly if there are plans or policy provisions that need to go through through y'all as well as committee chairs. Great, thank you. Thank you. Okay, next we'll move to Director Hersey. I just want to say a big thank you to everybody who's put hands on this work. This has been an incredibly huge lift, especially to the staff that engaged with us around this. And we would be remiss if we did not give a huge shout out to Seattle Council PTSA, specifically Manuela Sly and Sabrina Burr for helping us lift up the community engagement around this and holding us accountable to thinking through every one of these issues. I will say that while this is a moment to celebrate, all of the weeks that led up to this point have been incredibly tumultuous. And I wanna be very clear that now that we are at this moment, I sincerely hope that we as a district, especially in terms of leadership, can come together and actually work collaboratively to get these things done because our students deserve it. And that is going to be an expectation not only from the board, but from our community as well. I'm excited to hit a little bit of a restart button here and really dig in and sink in and see how we can do this to best support all of our students in this district. Thank you so much, Director Hersey. Director Harris. I will in fact vote for this, but I will do so reluctantly because the engagement for the Board of Directors has been less than. And I hope that with weekly work sessions and more robust communication as we work through the details, and the details are absolutely critical, and we do a better job of community and family engagement, and we must because each and every one of the board directors are getting hundreds of emails a day asking questions. And, and there are questions, quite frankly, that many of us board directors can't answer because the information has not been disseminated to us. Um, we got to do better. We must do better. And I well appreciate this is a once in a lifetime, we sincerely hope and pray, pandemic. And I also appreciate the fact that this is one of those places where we potentially could change the way we deliver education. But putting these plans together before collective bargaining seems like the cart before the horse to me. And I'm extremely distressed by that fact. I will vote yes, but I will do so reluctantly. Thank you. Director Hampson. Uh, I can't say it better than um, Director Hersey said it in terms of gratitude that goes out to um, Seattle Council PTSA um, and the leadership there that has been doing tireless work to engage families during this very difficult time. And the just the number of the sheer number of voices that they have brought to us and to the table, I'm eternally grateful. Um, and 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 this is really, you know, kind of for them in terms of, um, moving in a direction that does center not those for whom this is easiest, but those for whom this is the most difficult, for whom we are least likely to succeed with laptops and synchronous versus asynchronous learning. Um, this is this is for all of the, the centering all of those students and those families. Um, we are doing our damnedest to turn our attention and the attention of this district to you and we hope that you feel this as part of that effort and we have to roll up our sleeves. I am really um, grateful to my fellow board members um, and, and to staff that have worked with us in these tiny little micro moments leading up to this for getting to this point and for coming together and showing that we can work collaboratively and we owe nothing less to our students. And this needs to be, as Director Hersey said, a restart and um, a harbinger of things to come that are good um, in terms of what we can accomplish and what we can demonstrate and what we can learn as a school community about how to do things differently for our kids. Thank you. 
Thank you, Director Hampson. And I will close out quickly because we have certainly gone over time. Uh, I do want to just extend gratitude to our staff, particularly our board office staff, Ms. Wilson-Jones, Martina Loffelman, and, and Aaron Bennett for your work uh, managing all of the work um, to get our board to these meetings and, and to manage these meetings. So I thank you. I um, also just want to highlight again uh, the fact that I look forward to um, rolling up uh, and creating the oversight groups to help monitor the progress uh, on, on uh, educational delivery over the course of the next year. Uh, and, and I'll just finish by saying, uh, you know, this time has been scary and hard, uh, and I know it makes us all angry and frustrated and sad and tired and exhausted, but I think, um, if anything, I will just, just illustrate to our community that since March 12th, which is exactly five months ago today, this board has really not stopped relenting, and I, I can't tell you the amount of times uh, board directors have, we have called each other, texted each other in the middle of the night, working over the weekends. Um, we have not let up in those last in the last five months, and we will continue to do so. And, and I want to just highlight that on Monday, August 17th at 7.30 a.m., we we're right back into the 2020-21 academic year with our first uh, audit and finance committee meeting. So we are not letting up. We are going to continue to persevere and be relentless in our work and our commitment to you, our community, and the voters. Um, and it will, and certainly the work, even if it's hard and scary uh, and challenging, uh, it will not stop us from showing up every day. And so I appreciate you all for joining us today. And I will now turn it over to Ms. Wilson Jones for the final roll call vote, please. President DeWolf, like, can I just make a clarification? Ops is actually happening tomorrow as the oh, first committee right. meeting of the year. Thank you. So, Thank you. Uh, four o'clock tomorrow, operations committee. Thank you. Oh, yeah, we have CNI too next week. <laughs> Thank you all. Okay, Ms. It's Wilson all blurring Jones, together, to so. Yes, calling the roll on the underlying item as amended by Amendment 1 and 2. Uh, Director Mack? Aye. Director Rankin? Aye. Director Rivera-Smith? Aye. Director Hampson? Aye. Director Harris? Aye. Hersey? Aye. Excitedly, aye. Director DeWolf? Director DeWolf? Aye. Aye. Motion has passed unanimously. Thank you. Uh, Thank you all directors for your discussion uh, and, and thoughtful questions and concerns today. Thank you to staff for, for being here today. Thank you to our, our community for being on the call as well as those who have been watching through our YouTube channel. Um, as there is no further business on this agenda, this meeting does stand adjourned at 4.30 p.m. Wednesday, August 12th. And again, we'll see folks tomorrow uh, to join us at the operations committee uh, at four o'clock tomorrow. Thank you all and have a great rest of your day. Thanks, everyone.